Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the longest lasting workshop that has been funded by the NSF. How many years is it? It's 29. 29 years, right? That's older than some of you here. <laughs> Uh, and it started when uh, a group of uh, students from uh, Carver Meads Lab decided that they wanted to keep meeting on an annual basis. We had a meeting uh, in Idlewild, and uh, then that led to an NSF workshop, and that led to, uh, which, which was just mainly planning, you know, for uh, in Washington, and then it led to the first neuromorphic workshop, which was held here. We didn't go to Aspen because it was too expensive, but now Telluride's become too expensive. So, so, but it's a wonderful, wonderful place, as you'll see. Uh, if, if you've been out hiking, it's just a wonderful place. So uh, you're, we're going to be hearing a series of speakers this week who are going to try to give you a feeling for where we are, uh, trying to understand how the brain works. So you know, the brain is the most complex device in the known universe. My wife corrected me. No, say strictly true because the brain is a subset of the body. Uh -huh. The body is the most complex device in the universe. And if any of you know about robotics, how difficult that is, right? You realize that that, that, that that's a real challenge. We have, you know, we have networks now, these transformers that can talk to us. But we don't have ro robots that run around and, and pick up coffee cups and, and do things that we can do without even thinking, right? So it's clear that there's a lot more work to be done. So today's, in fact, that uh, segue into today's first talk by Lisa. She's already introduced herself. Let me just give you a little background. Uh, so Lisa was a, uh, a graduate student with John Doyle at Caltech. Uh, by the way, John Doyle is no longer with us. In person, he's actually on the <laughs> Okay, okay, there he is. Okay, and uh, she had her thesis defense just a few weeks ago. And uh, I asked the first question, I was also on Zoom. And uh, she did a Fabulous, gave a fabulous talk. And um, we actually are a co author on a paper that was recently accepted. In PNAS uh, on the topic you're going to be hearing about internal feedback, which is a great story. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for that lovely introduction. So I figured I would start with um, some introduction on control theory as that's a little bit not in the mainstream of neuroscience. So um, I like to say that control theorists think in block diagrams. So here's a block diagram of a controller in the top box and some system composed of some dynamics and noise. And the controller interfaces with the dynamics and noise, it receives sensory information, and then it computes the best course of action or actuation. So some examples, many of us got here on an airplane. An airplane is a system, physical system governed by you know, the laws of thermodynamics and aerodynamics. And so so it's, it's really a plant, right? It's a plant. Yeah, but I don't want to use that word. Yeah, I mean, you're yeah. talking about control theory. That's what it's called. Right? Yeah, it's I, like to, I like to say system. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. People get confused with an animal when you talk about a plant. Exactly. <laughs> airplane is one type of plant. Right, and on the airplane, we have control algorithms. So you have some sensors on the airplane, right? Gyroscopes, I and use, so forth. And then your control algorithms say, okay, this is the sensory information. Maybe the pilot wants to Oh, in a straight line. And here are the wing angles and thruster frequencies to make us achieve our objective. For neuroscience, a maybe better example is the brain and the limbs on our body. So the limbs, again, governed by biomechanics, physics, and the brain says we'll get some sensory information, maybe visual, proprioceptive. And then again, we need to compute what, uh, you know, what appropriate muscle we want. So ultimately, control theory is asking, what is a good map from sensing to actuation, given some dynamics, some objectives, and maybe also some constraints? In other words, what is the best controller, hence the name control theory. Another important part of control theory is closed loop analysis. So we don't just care about the controller. We don't just care about the control algorithms, right? We want to make the whole system do what we wanted it to do. So that's where you'll hear terms like stability and so forth. Um, 
kind of a cornerstone of control theory. Uh, for those of us not familiar with control theory, you might have nonetheless heard of it um, as PID, proportional integral derivative controller, linear quadratic regulator, LQR, or model predictive control MPC. This is in order of increasing sophistication. And in neuroscience, control theory um, plays a key role in sensory motor and motor models. And one thing that I like about using control theory as a model of um, neuroscience is that it provides prior models, which are human interpretable. And what I mean by that is all you need to make a controller is to know some model of your system dynamics, some objective, and maybe some constraints. These can be informed by data, but you don't need data to translate those three things, dynamics, objective, and constraints, into the controller. So you can say, given what we know, this would be the best mapping from sensing to actuation. And then you can you know, compare it with existing data or so forth. But this is a complementary approach to popular data-driven approaches in which we take data and then we say, what can we see from this data? So it's a kind of nice complement. And today I'm gonna to be talking about two uh, projects in which control theory plays a role in helping us understand more about the brain. The first is distributed control and cortical feedback. And the second is a learning and control model of locomotion in Drosophila. So we'll start with this one, and I have to talk a bit about cortical feedback, or what we call internal feedback. So you might have also heard of this as um, recurrence or uh, predictive feedback or descending feedback. Same names for the different names for the same concept. So let's say we have an animal and we have some external environment. So we have to receive information from the environment. Let's say we're receiving visual information. So it goes to our eye, uh, projects to thalamus, projects to cortex, primary visual area, V1. And there's a bit of processing done at each of these um, kind of stages. And then after V1 does the processing, it sends the information along to other parts of the brain, which do, let's say, more abstract uh, processing. So these are typically retinotopic, so it's kind of very one-to-one uh, -one coordination with the pixels that you see, for example. And then as we get to V2 or MT and IT, you start thinking about semantics rather than literal pixels, right? You extract is what the object is doing, which way it's moving and so forth. And once you are able to compute this information, uh, you use it to make planned motor movements. So M1 plus it's, you know, motor cortex, roughly speaking, and that projects to spinal cord. And then we do some, you know, actuation. So this is uh, what I'm going to be calling the feed forward direction. It makes intuitive sense. Right? You receive sensory information, you process, and then you act. But what internal feedback is, it's uh, synapses in the other direction. Information flow in the opposite direction of what we expect, sort of. And the most well-documented instances are along the primary visual areas, uh, to and from V1. So this raises some questions, right? What are they doing? What, what does these uh, pink arrows do? And I'm gonna walk over very briefly some of the existing um, explanations so you have an idea of the flavor. So one explanation is that they modulate the feed forward processes. Two very popular ones are Bayesian inference and pre oops, predictive coding. So they're doing some kind of prediction. And these primarily focus on, again, the visual modules. So let's say V2 and V3 is sending predictive signals to V1. Recurrent neural nets, another popular one. So the idea here is that recurrence in neural networks improves the performance of neural networks. Since our brain performs so well, it is a sort of neural network, therefore it makes sense to have recurrence in our brain. And last of all, uh, sort of old, but the idea of the efference copy. So uh, maps of uh, set motor plans getting sent to other parts of the brain to help them predict. Now, what most of these don't address and what I'm going to try to address today is why there is so much internal feedback. In some of these cases, the pink arrow in terms of number of synapses or in terms of explanatory power actually outnumbers the black arrow. For example, V1, I think, is almost equally explained by feedback um, from V2 than it is from V4 from thalamus. So this is, it's not just, you know, a little bit of internal feedback, it's actually a lot. Okay, so since I'm a control theorist, I decided to look at this from the lens of control theory. So now I have to give you a bit of a background on control theory, uh, how it's traditionally used here. So 
Linear optimal controllers explain sensory motor behaviors in reaching and tracking. Let's give an example. So let's say we have some organism, maybe us, a human, in the lab, and we instruct the human to reach for some uh, target, and then we maybe have a robotic arm that adds perturbations as they do, and then we record the experimental trajectory of the arm. So this is an experiment that was done in some of these works. You can translate this to the language of control theory. Okay, we have some objective, right? Reach for the target. We have some dynamics. So x, y coordinates plus force. And we have the noise, which is the robotic arm. So we can translate that using control theory. And we can say, let's uh, make the optimal controller for our objective and dynamics. You can do that. And then you can simulate what uh, the optimal controller says the trajectory should look like. And it turns out that these simulated trajectories from optimal control have good explanatory uh, capabilities for the experimental trajectory. Now, so I, what I just talked about wasn't behavior, right? Internal feedback goes on inside the brain. So natural next step is to say, okay, let's see what goes on inside the controller, open it up and see if we can explain physiology. And here we hit a hitch because in many standard models of optimal control, it's just the matrix K, it's just the matrix multiplication. There's no feedback, there's sometimes not even dynamics, there's not very resemblatory of the brain. And what we argue is that we actually were missing one more key ingredient, which is that we need to include biological constraints in our controller. And that, uh, in particular, we think about communication constraints. And that was the subject of this trio of works. And then that will let us explain physiology a little bit better. And of course, this type of communication constraint is ubiquitous in biology, right? Neurons, cells, and so forth, everything signals with delay that's um, much larger in magnitude than the delay we're used to working with electronics. But control theory, historically, hasn't had to deal too much with it. So we need a little bit of new theory as well. Toby, did I see a question? Or... Yeah, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> cool. So we're going to do a bit of math now. So this is um, the standard setup of a linear discrete time domain system in the language of control theory. So x here is the state. And what we're saying is the state at the next time step, so you've chosen some kind of discretization size, the state at the next time step is a linear combination of the current state, that's the ax term, plus some action u of t multiplied by some matrix b, plus some noise. Um, for the rest of the talk, we're going to be working in Z domain. So we do a Z transform. This is basically just the discrete version of Fourier transform. And you get some dynamics in frequency domain. It looks roughly the same. OK, so what do we do in control theory once we have this model? So we have these dynamics. And state feedback control, one of the most kind of popular and simple types, is to say, OK, we have our controller, and what we know is that we'll be able to access the state directly. So for instance, if your state is position and velocity, you're just saying, I can directly sense position and velocity. And then I'm going to have a matrix K multiply the state, and that will produce the optimal action, right? And, and the feedback law K, which is roughly speaking a matrix. And you do this by minimizing over some objective of your choosing. So F is just whatever objective function you can choose. It can be, typically it's a quadratic penalty and that'll lead you to LQR. Okay, this is very, very standard. And now we're gonna think about what this standard model assumes. So let's assume that we have some dynamics of eight nodes, which are dynamically coupled to the neighbors. So if you want, you can think of one of them as maybe your hand and the other as your elbow and the other as your shoulder and these are dynamically coupled, you know in a chain sort of configuration. Now, what the standard feedback control assumes is that you have a centralized, global, central, instantaneous uh, controller. So it does instantaneous uh, communication to and from every single node. This one K matrix or controller senses from everybody and computes and sends back to everybody. Now, this is not quite how biology works. So what we want to think about is instead distributed local controllers. So here we have four little local controllers. And instead of receiving information from every single part of the system, it receives information from only three in this diagram. And you, know, you can make this arbitrary. And then it does some local computations. 
and it sends back out the signals to these three um, nodes. And additionally, we might say that these are not instantaneous communications, right? There has to be some kind of sensory or actuation delay. Okay, so the standard formulation I showed assumes some kind of centrality. We want distributedness. So to do that, what we do is we introduce a new variable phi, which maps from the exogenous disturbance delta to the state and input x and u, the things that we care about. And if you do some math and finesse this, you can massage that formulation into this formulation, which is called the system level synthesis formulation. And I'm going to give an NC talk about this in the afternoon. Yeah, there's going to be at what time? I think two. At, the end, at two, there's going to be an NC uh, meeting, and then Lisa's going to give a talk, a Blackboard talk, so you can follow it completely about how this is all related to model predictive control, right? Yeah, more math details there, no math details here. Yeah, but this delta is the noise, right? So why is the noise going to that map? Is so, that Sorry? Why does the noise, is delta the noise? Yes. And why does that go into this map? So the map, the purpose of the map is to say, it maps from the, the one thing you can't control, which is delta here, to the things that you care about x and you can't control. Yeah, you can't control the exogenous. Okay. That's the assumption. All right, so these two formulations are identical. And what's H infinity? <laughs> Terry asked what H infinity is. It's a different mode of control. It's robust control, and this is standard control, I would say. So it's a, it's a different. There's formulations in H infinity for this, but we won't get into that. Come this afternoon. This <laughs> But you're yeah. not the first to understand. Like, yeah. Looking forward to talking this afternoon. But, <laughs> yes. um, so delta is noise. Yes. And I suppose the U will be direct functional delta. So it, this assumes that the controller needs to know the noise, right? So not quite. So what happens uh, in reality is the controller reconstructs an estimation of the noise, and then it uses that to. Like a Kalman yeah. filter? Not quite. Not in this case. Um, Anyway, let's yeah. go ahead. I suggest you go ahead and then maybe it'll be more clear, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. Actually, I was just going to gloss over the math and jump into the details. But... All right. So the reason why we might prefer the second and slightly more mystifying formulation is that you can implement this formulation distributively and it accommodates those biologically relevant communication constraints, you know, delay, local communication, and so forth that we care about. And the resulting controller will look like this. So remember that we have one K matrix, right? Now we're gonna have something a little bit more sophisticated. It still maps from state to action. So it is still a state feedback controller. So what you would do is you would solve this minimization, obtain your optimal values of feet, and then you would put them in this configuration to create the controller. I think this is only, this is one of the only controllers currently that accommodate these local constraints. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask, what can the implementation of this distributed controller tell us about cortex? And now we're going to attempt to implement this controller distributedly. So first, we need to think about what information structure is needed to implement the controller, and that will indicate to you what kinds of communication are required. So we're going to focus on that box over there in the bottom right. So this is a multiplication in frequency domain, which is a convolution in time domain, and that's just an equation of the convolution. Let's say your convolution has uh, some horizon, capital T. Let's say it is equal to five. Then, pictorially, your convolution will look like this. So your inputs are delta hat. So you have these vectors, delta hat. Let's say you have five of them. And each of them is multiplied by some constant matrix, um, those like phi u bracket things. And then they get summed up to output u. So this is just the convolution in pictures. Uh, as time progresses, the elements move, right? You get more recent entries and you no longer use the oldest entries. All right, let's, uh, so, okay. Actually, let me go back. So each of these is a vector of global size that includes global information. I just said that's not what we want, right? We want local information. So now we're gonna do exactly that. What we can do using this phi formulation is we can say, let's constrain our optimization variable phi to be sparse in some way. Here I've constrained it to be kind of tri-diagonal. 
And what this allows us is to say, instead of having a big centralized controller, each node can take its corresponding row of our decision variable and implement a local controller. What's that by you again? So that is the map from um, the disturbance to the input. Yeah. You've got, <clears throat> I hope you're going to get to this, but if you've got all these local controllers, yes. you've got to find some way to parse who contributes what. Yes, so actually so each, problem, don't you? So each controller, I think I think it'll be a little bit clearer afterwards, okay. but um, essentially each controller will only control its own. So like the control local controller in node four is only going to output actuation to node four. So you're sticking with local? Yes. Okay. What is the physical basis for assuming that the noise can be mapped to the state variable and action? So this is so no assumptions underlie this. So when you start with the standard state uh, state feedback formulation, uh, you can all, for any controller you can always rewrite the map to get to the formulation of the. And I'm going to show that this afternoon. So there are no assumptions that are required. Well, the other thing that it's stable, but other than that, no assumptions. So, so in a way, you are assuming that each of those variables have some distribution, like a noise, correct? No, you can write it exactly if you know the exact number. No, I know, but it is still based on noise, which you cannot control, as you said. Yes, and so it's mapping from the exogenous factor into the, you know, the endogenous variable. Which means your u and x now have some noise element. Not necessarily, because you can write the map deterministically without having to know the noise deterministically. Yeah. So isn't delta simply your model prediction error? In this case, Delta hat is your model prediction error. That's exactly right. Yeah. So the communication delay you're going to explain in a minute? Yes. OK. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide, that is. All right, so this is the uh, local circuit as node four. So it looks quite like the convolution picture that I drew on the last slide. But one key difference: now instead of having global size vectors, we have a vector here of size three. So each of these is a scalar. Okay, and this is because we've constrained the operator phi to be sparse, right? So you have a vector of size three multiplied by a row of size three. So there's good compatibility there. So the central values. Are computed locally, and I'll, I'll show you the circuit uh, in a minute. The peripheral values are communicated from our nearest neighbors. We don't need them you know, from distant ones because we've constrained phi to be sparse in that pattern. Delay. So we can add delay by adding more sparsity constraints on earlier spectral elements of phi. So here we're saying this guy has to be just one value. And these ones can have three values. And semantically, this corresponds to saying we receive communication from our neighbors. They're going to be delayed by one time step. And that's why this part is empty, right? When we receive them, they're already one step out of date. And now, now I will show you the circuit that computes this, and that will bring us back to internal feedback. So uh, that's the circuit, and it outputs the actuation at this one node, U4. So that's that box right there in the top, bottom right. We have a second box there, and that, fortunately for us, looks quite similar. Sorry, it's a convolution also over delta hat, and it looks like this. What that circuit outputs is the predicted state x hat for, and this gets subtracted from our sensed state x for, and that is exactly, in our case, the prediction error. And in the case of state feedback, the only source of the prediction error can come from noise. All right. So this circuit computes delta hat for these yellow terms and missing one last thing, which is that we have to receive information from our neighbors to get the uh, pink and green terms. And actually, I'm missing one more thing other than that, which is that this is the local circuit at node four. There's many other nodes. Each of them has their own version of the circuit. Therefore, we must also communicate our prediction errors to the neighboring circuits. All right. And now, finally, we are ready to look at internal feedback once more. So in this picture, feed forward is coded by the black arrows and internal feedback by the colorful arrows. Right, so what is feedback doing in this model? Well, in this bolded path, feedback is trying to predict the incoming sensory states. 
this is, uh, I would say this is not a new idea in, in neuroscience. Certainly, I will point out that because of the way we formulated the model, phi x, which maps from noise to state, is a closed loop map. It includes not only what we predict will happen in the external environment, but also our self-generated motions. So for example, so our visual field right, changes when we see something happen in the world, but it also changes when we do something, right? If I shake my head, certainly my visual field will change, but that's not necessarily because something happened in the world. So prediction errors um, generated by a closed loop model, which includes the external system and the uh, motor self-generated yeah. errors. Yeah. Could you just please explain? I understand the prediction error. That's very really easy to understand. Yes. We're trying to predict uh, the state. Yes. Can you just explain a bit more about why you're, why the estimating from the disturbance, well, the noise, Yes. Uh, the actuation? What's the principle of that? Right? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Estimating from, so what is the principle of estimating the disturbance? I mean, how do you know what that noise is? You don't, you have a model that estimates this noise. Yes, exactly. System noise. Yep. Which includes sensing noise and also external. Like in this case, there is no sensing noise. In this specific um, thing that I'm presenting, there is only system noise. So there's no sensing noise. What you can do that, noise? but it would what be. Is that? What kind of noise is that? Is that like in, imprecision in your muscle actuation or something? So it could arise from imprecision in your muscle actuation. It could also arise from environmental perturbations. So let's say I have a perfectly good model of my arm, but someone could come and poke me, right? That would be a. Uh, and you're trying, and this the system is estimating from how is it you doing that again? Could you just say again how phi goes to u? So there's two. Oh, uh, delta goes to u, sorry. Yeah, so delta goes to u from this phi u map. So, okay, so we recreate the deltas that the delta has, right? And then we uh, we just multiply or convolve over phi u to produce u. And from that delta, which we get from so, so the delta hat comes from subtract comparing the incoming sensory information from the okay. it's really the prediction error. Exactly. Yeah, prediction error. Exactly. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So isn't this like a Kalman filter except distributed? Uh, I would say Kalman filter. It's a little bit simple, so that's why I'm a little reluctant to call this specific instance a Kalman filter, but a linear filter. Yes, it's a linear filter. There is also. But, but, but I, I think that look, look you, you, you know, this is uh, in engineering. Distributed control hasn't been explored because you, there is no internal delays. You can basically have a single. You show at the beginning central controller. Yes. And you don't need distributed uh, control the way that we have it in the brain, but it's even worse because the brain has its internal time delays. Exonal propagation, synaptic time delays, dendritic time delays, which, as you know, time delays kill you if, you're, if you have a controller, right? So this is basically a solution to how the brain might be able to, to subtract away uh, and, and compensate for the time delays. That's really what the goal is. You know? And a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago, John Doyle gave this amazing talk based on similar principles looking at the possibility of a national electric grid, because it has to have distributed controllers because communication, even electronic uh, over the whole continent is slow relative to what needs to be controlled. So, biology. Yes, in fact, this was originally developed for that purpose. Yeah. Yes, and we found the bio uh, application later. Okay, so uh, prediction errors, that's one aspect of this. The other ones, so the dotted lines, those are what we might call uh, in neurobiology, lateral feedback. So it's connect uh, connections or communication between local circuits, right? And so in the brain, there's some idea that at least in parts of motor and motor related areas, what happens is parts of the brain will be responsible for parts of the body. For example, you might've heard of the hand knob, which is an area in the brain which corresponds quite uh, you know, accurately to the hand. And even though we have these kind of functionally localized parts of the brain, right? Part of the brain equals part of the body, there's nonetheless a lot of whole body signal in these 
uh, supposedly functionally localized parts of the brain. And this has been something of a, a, you know, a clash. So they're localized, but they contain full body signals. And what this model says is to function correctly, to have good performance, you need to have these uh, cross communications or cross body signals because your hand, even though you can you know, articulate by itself, is dynamically coupled to your elbow and the rest of your arm, right? If you do something with the rest of the arm, the hand is also going to be affected. So it makes sense that you should receive information at least from the elements that you're directly dynamically coupled to. And these are some things that I would argue are unique from applying distributed control. One aspect is the closed loop aspect. So the combination of sensory and motor prediction is something that um, control theorists do. So control theorists con considers from sensing all the way to motor. Whereas in neuroscience, for practical purposes, people tend to focus on just vision or just motor. So it's useful in some cases to consider the full loop. And additionally, distributed control allows us to think about these local circuits and this cross communication. Okay, uh, there's one more question that I raised at the beginning that I have to ask, which is why there is so much internal feedback. So I've zoomed out here a little bit and now I have uh, little circuits for three of the nodes. And you'll notice that node three in this case has no uh, actuation output, but nonetheless, it still contains the little prediction circuit. <laughs> so in our model, what internal feedback does is it's predicting and communicating uh, prediction errors and sensory input. So when you have any kind of sensing, you should predict and communicate the errors to your neighbors. Node 3 doesn't have actuation, but regardless, it's predicting and communicating its sensory input to its neighbors, for example, node 4, which is actuated and requires input from there. So for instance, if your hand was locked, for instance, and someone gave you an elbow moving task, it is still useful for you to know from your sensory information what's happening to your hand, even if you can't actuate, right? They're dynamically coupled. Feed forward do in this model. Feed forward dictates the actuation output. So if you don't have actuation output, your feed forward is going to stop at some point. Now, so there's this asymmetry now, right? Feedback, uh, you know, serves sensors and feed forward serves actuations. Now, in most applications and organisms, we have a lot more sensing than we do actuation. And this is typically because, well, actuation is typically more energetically expensive. It's much cheaper to get a ton of sensory information than it is to act. And that seems to suggest, at least from our model, that we ought to have more feedback than feed forward. Another way you can think about it is that feedback must filter down our sensory information to produce the appropriate motor outputs. So we start with a huge dimension of uh, sensory information, for example, vision, but largely most of it is not that useful. It's predictable, it's static. And we filter out those elements to extract what the you know, salient features are for the motor defeat. Okay, so that is to wrap up the first half, which is the big half, the second half is smaller. To wrap up the first half, so we managed to come up with some new explanations of internal feedback by incorporating physiological communication constraints. And as Terry mentioned, this is something that control theory doesn't do a lot of. It's starting to have a, you know, a bit of an uptick, but ultimately control theory is not used to dealing with this kind of communication constraints. And incorporating them lets us model the system better. So, so th this is, I, I think, a really novel way to think about that internal feedback. And, and it turns out that there is a part of neuroscience where this has actually been worked out in great detail, and it's for electric fish. So electric fish, are uh, they create their own external electric field, and they use electrosensors on the surface of the, of the, of the fish's body to detect disturbances outside the fish. In other words, uh, objects, especially if you're in the Amazon where the water is muddy, you can't use your vision, but you can detect things. And you can communicate with other lucky fish, right? But here's the problem. The problem is that you are creating a field which is much greater in terms of amplitude. And it's, by the way, it goes at a kilohertz. It's an oscillatory field that's constantly cycling. But it's much bigger in amplitude than the the, uh, the disturbances, the perturbations caused by the environment, right? So here, we they worked out that there's a whole, uh, uh, it, 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 it's called neuroethology, right? Neuroethologists have worked out the whole circuit. Walter Heidegger, who is a colleague of mine at UCSD, 
uh, was, was one of the pioneers. And, uh, but, but this particular circuit uh, it involves a structure in the brain of the electric fish called the E, which is cerebellum -like. And it gets two inputs. It gets an input, which is an inverse copy of what this actual signal being generated internally that's being broadcast out. And the, the feedback coming from the environment, what it does is it tracks the internal generated signal from the, the signal coming back. So you subtract out the big carrier and, you, and the small signal that comes out is what you use. It's exactly the circuit that she showed, right? That, that's the feedback, subtracting out self-generated motion, self-generated sensory signals. Now, the beauty is they've also worked out the synaptic plasticity. So it turns out it's anti hebbian right? So you have a, you know, one signal coming in, you want to subtract from the other. What you do is instead of have, have this increase the strength of the synapse if this input and output of the neurons are say, happening at the same time, coincidence detection. But for anti heavy what you do is if they come in at the same time, you reduce the strength of the synapse. And if you do that, you can simulate the circuit and, and uh, account for almost all of the behavior. Yeah. So you what about the phase? How does it synchronize the phase of the self-generated field with the ambient coming back? Uh, and the tail, you said? Phase. The phase of the Oh, the phase. Okay, okay. So, the, the, so there's a very elaborate, I'm, I'm giving you sort of that one, cir one, one part of the circuit. There's a much more complex circuit that you know, shapes the signal coming back. And the phase the relationship is, is the really, the, it's equivalent to a time difference. That's right. Like phase. That's right. And, and so it's, it's all about phase. In fact, it turns out I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking on um, what day is it? Thir Thursday, I think. Thursday morning. Where I'm going to tell you all about traveling waves and phase. So, you know, just wait until. Well, and in fact, there are more than, there's more than one kind of electric fish. And some of them look as if they're doing this using time domain techniques. And the other set right. look as if they're doing it using Fourier techniques. The Fourier, the fish that are doing the Fourier um, trick have sensors on the head, the lateral part of the head, and on the tail. And the ones who are doing it in the time domain have a series of sensors along the body, the lateral line organ. And that, I think Heiligenberg was the first one to notice that difference. Yeah, that's right. So th th this is a nature to be extremely diverse in terms of the techniques that it uses in solving yeah. problems. And this is a good example. Question. Uh, question back to Lisa. Okay. Um, would, so, would you think this communication communication constraint, especially the delay, is uh, that we need to put on our models to understand it, or it's also a feature that will help us with more complex controls? If you want, if you think if I'm an engineer doing a robot new robot system, should I take that from the brain, or should I? Do um, so, what I would say is. Yes, definitely. It's a feature in biology that we try to model. On the engineering side, I'm a little bit skeptical when people say something like delay will help us better, because if you have a instantaneous centralized omniscient controller, mathematically, it's less constrained and therefore should perform better. I think there are cases in which kind of delay coding or time based coding can help pick up things that kind of instantaneous plus may not. But in this specific case, the math I just presented centralized and non related all the better. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so, Lisa, yeah. if that's true, you're skeptical, then why is it that we don't have robots with central control that can do as well as we can, as animals can do? I don't think centralized is the reason. There may be some advantage of distributed control, in addition to the fact that you have a you know, I think the key you have, you have a bug which becomes a feature. I think there are maybe additional advantages. But I think the key advantage is actually energy efficiency, which obviously we're much better at than robots. Okay, well that's yeah. efficiency, right? But also things that much gets much worse. So look, look, the real problem is degrees of freedom. I mean, you know, talking about hundred muscles, how many muscles, a couple hundred muscles you have, they all affect each other. And if you if you if you actually do a control model where you put together an equation. For all of those pieces, it's, it goes up exponentially in terms of the interaction between the pieces. This is a solution 
which was actually very practical. It's not exponential. Yeah, it can resolve complexities. That's true. Complexity. But I would argue it's a necessary simplification rather than so it's better in terms of computation. But if you were magically able to solve a very complex equation, that would perform as good or better. Well, that's efficiency. Yes. My question is actually related to that. So I think you showed a very nice explanation how this can work, but that's it's based on the assumption that you have to try diagonal certain matrix. Structure like that the problem decomposes nicely, but the, in the most general form, you would have like a dense matrix, and everyone would need to talk to everyone else. And the problem so, in the, the right? that's, a, that's a good question. So, I did the diagonal circular matrix just because it's very easy to understand. You'll notice that actually the diagonal circular matrix matches exactly the, the plant that we're talking about. So, if your plant has some kind of um, sparsity in the plant, for instance, not every part of the plant is coupled to every other part of the plant, then what you can do is generally you can get away with having a sparsity that reflects the dynamical couplings of whatever plant system that you're working with. And it would be like a systematic way to figure out, like having some system to figure out, like, can you actually do this, like efficiently? Yeah, so the easiest way to do this is to actually just run it and see if it runs, and it is very scalable, so you'll figure out the ability of Designs it for you, the, those patches. Yeah. So, so, Lisa, maybe you're going to talk about this, but in the body of, of all animals, you have various levels of control yes. in the periphery. So, when a motor command is sent out, you know, it goes to the brain stem, it goes to uh, nuclei in the spinal cord that uh, each have their own dynamics and control. Yeah. Uh, and does this strategy, how does this strategy work at multiple levels of control? So, multiple layers. Yes, yeah, so I'm not kidding. Right. I'm looking at John. Yeah, yeah. He right here. He jumped at this, right? Yes, yes. So, I would think this belongs nearer to the lower layers or the more unconscious layers. Yes. Oh, or, I would not say this applies particularly directly to think a higher level layer functions such as the decision making. So, yes, so I would say this is. On the unconscious layer, you've sent a specific action, and now you have to. But but it certainly it certainly applies to as your diagram indicated all of the sensory information coming into the cortex and the motor cortex and the feedback. Yeah. So so it, it, but you're, you what you're saying is I think that there's another layer on top of all that which yep. is not in your diagram, which is the prefrontal cortex, which is doing planning and can interrupt that yes. sensory motor loop. Or inform it, right? So you well, need much less bits to say like move my hand from X to Y, and then you need all the, I would argue even more complex bits to make the muscles move from X to Y, right? So that's almost the- Well, I'm, I'm thinking more that, you know, if you, if you were trying to move your hand around an object and it gets something- That's true. It, it stops. Well, you, then you have to have another controller on top to decide what should I do next in order to reach the, the object behind the barrier, yes, right? You have, to, you have to interrupt and you have to create a new plan. And that's not in your model. No. All right. Uh, okay. Another thing that I did emphasize, which is considering the full sensory motor loop, right? Uh, sensing ultimately serves actuation, right? If you have a bunch of sensory information, you can't act on it at all. Not very beneficial to you as an animal. So it is often beneficial to think about the full loop rather than vision in isolation. Also, there's tons of fun things to do in vision in isolation as well. And for engineering, I mean, some people have asked some good questions, but one question we can ask is. So the question, the thing that I said where our sensory input is governed almost mostly by our self-generated uh, movements, right? This is true not only of animals, but also of robots and perception. So how can we leverage that knowledge to perhaps make more efficient prediction and perception? So what I presented is this top paper here, it's a controls paper, and we also uh, discuss feedback in a sort of more neuro-friendly way, and that's the second paper with um, Anish John and Terry. Okay, so there's a second half to get to. It is shorter than the first. Um, and this is about learning and control. Drastically different, not much feedback here. Now we're just going to be concerned with model. Um, often a question I'll get from engineers is why do we want to study insects in the first place? So I must say insects, and particularly this fly, does so very good for robust locomotion in a variety of settings. So we can learn from studying this fly. Uh, I believe that they actually walk more than they fly. Some people say they should be called walks. And they are also more tractable to study. They have on the order of hundreds of thousands of neurons, whereas we have on the order of tens of billions of neurons. So they are more tractable to study. And uh, 
less ethically complicated, shall we say. <laughs> well, ultimately, we don't just want to learn about how the fly works, which is very interesting. What we want to do is extract the principles of sensory motor circuitry that are hopefully agnostic across animals. And this can help us to better think about rehabilitating human sensory motor disorders, and it can also give us ideas on how to design robotic locomotion. Okay, let's think about what we might want from a model of locomotion for an animal. First, we might want it to walk realistically, so it should model that which would, it you know, says that it's going to model. Walk realistically. Another reason why we may want it to walk realistically is energy efficiency. So organisms are known to have gates that are roughly um, optimized for some kind of energy efficiency. You can think about robotic gates versus animal gates. Robotic gates, at least the ones I've seen, are typically quite stompy, shall we say, and they're definitely not very energy efficient. So that's one point that we can learn from animals. We might want this model to include mechanical details, so joints and dynamics and so forth. Um, some models don't do that, as you'll see in a second, but this will be very relevant for something like robotics and also for analysis of uh, biomechanics. And third, the thing that I alluded to, we want to uncover some kind of physiological or design insight, some principle underlying the design of sensory motor circuitry. And for the fly, broadly speaking, the physiology can be partitioned as thus. So there's a, a brain of sorts, and it sends high-level commands such as which direction to walk or how fast to walk. And they have a ventral nerve cord, basically the fly's version of our spinal cord, and this coordinates between the sixth light of the fly which have their own local uh, proprioceptors and motor neurons and so forth, and they interact with the world via some dynamical equation. So as before, I will now walk you through some of the existing things so you have an idea of what's already out there, and then I'll present our model. So there's our three goals. And the first class of existing models is the class of physics engines and physical robots. So these, I would say, typically focus on the bottom uh, part of that diagram. They include a lot of mechanical details, possibly the most that you could possibly include. And, but then, I tune them to make some kind of walking. The walking is not very realistic, although they do walk. And in terms of physiological insight, it's a little bit limited, but I would argue that it's not really the goal of these models, which is very, very, very focused on the mechanical details. The second class is kind of the opposite of the first. It's a physiology-based model. So these um, researchers will say, well, we know how we know some properties of neurons. Let's try to put a group of neurons together and see if they can make coordinated, robust oscillations. Typically, what they'll do is they'll say one leg is one oscillator. So they'll abstract away the entire joint of the leg and just model it as an oscillator and think, how can we coordinate this uh, network of six oscillators? So not much mechanical details. And it's hard to say whether the walking is realistic if you don't have joints, right? So it oscillates. Um, in terms of physiological insight, again, because they're coming from constructing a system out of physiological parts, they can provide some physiological insight. The third and recently very popular class is the class of learning and optimization-based walking models. So this is saying, given some mechanical environment, uh, we'll come up with some clever learning rules or update rule or optimization, and will iteratively make the model learn to walk in this environment. There's cool videos of that. Um, the realism is mixed because it really depends on how cleverly you tune your. I think one of these walks really nicely, and one of them walks really weird. So mixed bag there. And uh, the model that I'm going to be talking about is a layered architecture combining control and learning that tries to model the full system. And this is a joint work with Bing Brunson, Lily Karashuk, and John Tuttle at the University of Washington, Seattle. So what this model starts with is a neural network. That's the data train part. And this is trained on hours and hours of data from Drosophila walking. And it's trained to do this. Given the current state of the joints, what is the most biologically feasible next uh, series of joint angles that you know, we've learned from data? And you can, what you can do is you can just call this iteratively and generate a trajectory of very realistic looking joint angles. No dynamics so far. But we're going to add the dynamics. So we're going to use a standard in robotics uh, link and joint. Yes, link and joint model of the leg. And we're going to interface between the neural net and the dynamics with an optimal controller, which takes the you know, current states and tries to make them track the uh, biologically realistic states. 
That's I don't quite get it. You're, you you can model the trajectories, right? Yes. Yeah, now your optimal controller is going to try to do the same thing. Yes. So what happens is the trajectory generator just gives you a trajectory. It doesn't think about dynamics or anything like that. So you can model dynamics and you can even model perturbations, right? What is so the yeah. OD models of, of the leg? Yes, the, it's, it's the, yeah, this is a quite standard. It's basically an arm model. It's like legs and arms. Okay. okay. <laughs> You can also have perturbations, right? You can also add noise on the model, and you can say try to track the, you know, the optimal uh, trajectory. Yeah. And I've talked about delays so much. It's here in this model as well. We can use a bit of a novel technique, kind of similar to the first part of the talk, where we can incorporate motor delays in flights, which are uh, experimentally characterized and not insignificant. And finally, we uh, coordinate all six legs with a coupled oscillator or chromodal oscillator in this case. But, but that's not done by the controller. It's done by um, some oscillator, which is yep. to be part of external from the trajectory generator. Yes, exactly. It's part of the brain. Is... I would say it's part of the ventral nerve cord, actually. It's part of the ventral nerve cord, okay. I have a picture of that later, so a little matching diagram. Right, so the full model will look like this. So there's one of these on each of the legs, and they, of course, uh, they are coupled by the coupled oscillators. So we asked a very good question because this is exactly what I do now. So roughly speaking, I've kind of color matched it, right? The phase coordinator is doing something that the interleg coordinator or the ventral nerve cord would do. These, uh, the combination of the neural net and the controller are doing what the local neurons and muscles would be doing. And then we have some dynamics models for body world and track. Okay, so now it remains for me to show you that it does indeed satisfy the goals that we laid out. The simplest is the mechanical detail that's included in the model. And uh, this is partially facilitated by the control, right? You can't just slap a neural net onto the dynamics. We tried. It did not work very well. So the controller helps you to maintain walking despite your patience. Realistic walking behavior. Okay, so here is a plot of one specific joint on one specific leg. The yellow line or the orange line, sorry, is the real data and the blue line is the model generated data. And what are the axes? Yeah, the, I was gonna say that. X axis is phase of walking. The walking is up to right? You can characterize the phase. And Y axis is the degree, the angle of the joint, right? They match up pretty well. They match up pretty well across a variety of walking speeds and also for different um, legs. And we also did this analysis for all the legs and all the joints, but this is just a you know, helpful visualization. Another helpful visualization. Yeah, it oh, looks like it's maybe kind of it shoots the peak. Sorry? Go back to it. Yes. It looks like the prediction undershoots the peak frequently. Slightly, yes, I would say. I would also say that's a difference of about four to five degrees. So it's visually not as, uh, it's hard to pick up on, like if you were just watching them walk. Yeah. But how do you ensure that your Kuramoto model, they remain within the bounds? Because it, I mean, how do you make sure that it's in the nice region of the Kuramoto model? Um, Fully sure on that. So I think my collaborators did that part, but we did also characterize that with a bunch of plots to show interlight coordination and to compare the models. So let's say yeah. if you, in your model, if you allow a large perturbation, yes, do you see instability, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, that's actually the next part. So you will see instability um, if you have a very heavy perturbation or a very high delay. But within nominal amounts of delay and perturbation, it is actually pretty good. So the controller actually. Uh, damps down the, uh, the perturbations enough that the oscillator does not get too affected. Yeah. So, sorry, a later question. Yes. The controller itself, the damping out, how did you come up with the estimate of the time constant from the damping? So the controller is. Did you fit it onto the data? Did you so the controller is not fitted onto the data. It's just the standard, semi standard uh, linear quadratic regulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's in discrete time actually, so we bake some kind of delay constant into it. Yeah, that I was asking okay. in the delay constant. Yeah, so we just uh, we simulated for a bunch. Okay. Oh, you know it's fine. But the zoom is kind of lagging the videos a little bit. Anyways, one of these is data, and one of these is model, and um, which one? <laughs> so thank you for asking this. This is why I. Like um, the one on the left is simulated and the one on the right is data, but I thank you for this question because it 
illustrates what I was trying to do with this video, which is that qualitatively, in terms of angles, they walk quite similarly. Our model doesn't do the sloppy thing that you know robots do. Okay, include uh, realistic walking behavior. One more. This just reminds me of Rod Brooks. So this this goes back like thirty years. Rod Brooks was at the AI lab mm -hmm. at MIT, and he decided that rather than use traditional control models, what he would do is try to develop a model for insect walking. So not that different from yours in terms of uh, having local controllers. Yeah. And uh, do you know anything? What happened from that? Do you know anything? Is the history there? Hi. It's worth taking a look at. Yeah. He had a whole theory. And, and also, the other guy, uh, Mark Tillman, mm -hmm. who was here at, uh, for many years uh, at the workshop, he would build robots for what was the name of the company that he worked for? Wow, wow, we. Wow, we. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, it turned out that they sold millions of these robots with the kids because, and he, he had in it a little simple controller mm -hmm. that controlled you know, the joints and it made you know, crabs that walked. So it's worth looking at the history here because the he worked on the NASA yes. moon buggy. Let's not go on stop right now. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm going to stop and do this. Look, release it. Yeah. I just want to understand. So if you go back a couple of slides here, then you learned the model already from data. I'm on top of that. In other words, if you go back to your uh, diagram in the beginning, you just got these lovely videos. Yeah, this one right here. So you have a trajectory generator that is the model. It's a neural network, but it is yes. a model. Yes. And it has all the constraints in it because it comes from the data. So now why do you have to have this uh, orange dynamics model as well? Um, because you want to be able to put perturbations in like in a way that makes sense physically. It's very unclear how you would well actually, so that's actually one thing we tried was we took the a trajectory generator and we said, what if we you know poke the light? And then it just everything is going to be bad. Well, well, that trajectory generator, yes, exactly. It didn't, it didn't generalize to these disturbances. No, not very much. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, you yeah, that's actually a great question. So, one of that is talk about it later, but one of the one of the functions of this is it allows you to generalize to perturbed walking with none there? of the training. With, okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. All right. Um, physiological insight, last thing. So what we claim is that our model helps us reveal a fundamental motor delay limit. So this heat map, the colors represent some kind of realism of walking or a similar similarity measured to data. So yellow means very realistic, walks good. Uh, dark blue means very unrealistic, walks bad, poorly, does not look like walking. On the x-axis is the perturbation strength, and on the y-axis is the motor delay in milliseconds. Uh, a small remark that Back of the envelope, this is roughly the range of biologically plausible perturbation. So what we did here is we assumed that the fly, I think, slips. And of course, based on body weight and friction coefficient, you can't have infinite slip force, right? So what's the perturbation? Like you push the egg in the model? Yeah, so in this case, we're saying that whenever it contacts the ground, it uh, you know it's gonna slip vertically. Slip, okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the delay from two? From the delay is from uh, so in our model, it's from the controller to from when the controller says, let's do this. To when it gets enacted in the dynamics. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. You know if this limitation is coming from the Kuramoto model itself? Yes. Uh, we do not believe so. It's possible. Yes. But the Kuramoto, some kind of cross like coordination also must exist in the in the um, fly. So it's, it's possible. Yeah. But no, I, I 90% confidence that it's coming from the controller because delayed control is difficult. Yeah. But, Going back to the, uh, the question of the fly, if you actually had collected data where you actually pushed the fly around, no. Would you, uh, if you actually had done that, then you could actually have a recover. You would not need that dynamics model because it's already with the train itself, right? Yes and no, because I assume you wouldn't be able to collect data for like infinite types of perturbations and so yeah, forth. Yeah, you actually so. sample distribution of, yeah. the, of the perturbations training data for it. Okay? Unless you have, yeah, of course, you cannot have infinite types of perturbations. So. Yeah, so but what I mean is that some degree of generalization is always necessary, and it's unclear to me whether even sampling adequately will help you to generalize. Or, to or could it be that you would use a deterministic neural model, a neural network, instead of uh, something that uh, 
uh, generates probab probabilistic responses. Yeah. You know, that would then learn to yeah. capture these disturbances uh, better. Uh, anyway. Yeah, it's possible, but yeah. no experiments. <laughs> okay, so right, so this is the range of biologically per plausible perturbations. But since we have a model and not an actual fly, we can perturb it as much as we want. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, in, in terms of the <clears throat> physiological insight, uh, yes. I'm, I'm wondering, like, what what is the specific form of the of the trajectory generator, and like, where do you think of that being in in the fly? So I think the trajectory generator is being implemented in some way per leg, I would say. So it's the neurons in the leg, and they have learned or were born with some predetermined kind of baseline walking behavior. Just, just to get a sense, like how complex is the trajectory generator as a the neural network? network. No. Yeah, the neural network. Uh, ooh, I would have to look into that and get back to you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so but it's a recurrent uh, network, right? Actually, no. I think it's just the. I think it's just the network. It's just the network. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, from this diagram, at least, what we claim is that the maximum motor delay that preserves walking under some plausible range of perturbations is around twenty milliseconds. Okay, let's go through this. So motors are like, let's look at the top rows here. The motors, are, it's just all yellow, right? When you have very, very low motor delay, actually the model produ uh, produces pretty realistic walking, even if you perturb it super hard. When you have no delays, the controller is quite good at rejecting whatever perturbation you give it. But as you get to around 20 uh, milliseconds, there's actually a blip here. I don't know if it's viewable, but 20 milliseconds still walks decently. 30 milliseconds is when you start to see so it walks good, it walks good, and then at this perturbation, it starts walking a little bit less good. And then, uh, you know, if, if you contrast this with 40, 50, and 60, right, as soon as you introduce any tiny bit of perturbation, the model starts being strange. So what's the calculated distance that that conducting speed that you would have would be able to cross? So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, right, so uh, luckily someone has done these experiments for us, and the known motor delay intrasoft so from motor neurons spiking to muscle spiking is about there. So this corresponds, that's nice, we did not use this information at all in the creation of this plot, and what we claim is that this reveals a kind of fundamental design insight with respect to delay. So. What we say is biology selects the maximum delay you can get away with. So we know that signaling in biology, the faster you signal, the more energetic resources you have to expend. As an animal, that corresponds to you having to eat more food, right? So we might want to be energetically cheaper. But if we have too much delay, terrible performance, you're going to get eaten by a, prey, a predator animal, and then all your energy efficiency is for naught. So you want to balance between these two. Yes. Can you say again for the biology, like which delay are you talking about? Uh, when you say this is the delay yeah. for the fly walking? I think it is the motor neuron spiking to the muscle contraction. Motor neuron spiking in the ventral nerve cord. No, 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 like on the leg. In the leg. Yeah, in the leg to the, that specific the muscle, muscle contraction. Muscle contraction. Yeah. yeah. That takes 30 milliseconds. <laughs> yeah. So how big of a fly program is that? How big of a fly program is that? Not sure. Did you have a question? Yeah, let me get some questions. Okay, because you can also say that time walks this far and can get away with giving the delays to the Yeah, yes, that's also true. Because what it can get away with is subject to how fast it walks and the environmental perturbation that it's used to. And perturbations will affect you differently depending on how fast Yeah, that's a great point. But essentially, what we're saying is that there's like these contrasting um, kind of goals for delay and biology tries to balance between them by picking the maximum that they can get away with subject to how it walks. What is yes. very realistic? It means what, how are you calculating realistic? Is it? So it's a similarity measure from, so we did some like factor analysis on the data and then we um, computed a kernel and basically compared the kernels. But, Roughly speaking, I would say like up to this color visually. If I gave you the videos, you would not be able to tell. Right, that's a really hard one. That is not a really joke about how big of a fly. I'm never thinking about the scalability of this entire thing. Yeah. So given the conduction speeds that you made, you're kind of tolerating. It's like, what's the biggest fly that you could make that behaves like a fly? 
They say they're like, what do you mean by like, like because like the size the distance or the conduction distance? I see. Have. Yeah. Because if you make the fly bigger, the conduction distance will be, and the delay that you can tolerate is also going to be different because of yes. that. But it's not just the conduction, right? The fly has to fly. Yeah. So it has to fly. It's like, you know, no, no. The question is, what she had this is a fly with failure, which you can actually make smaller tracks and no problem whatsoever. And if you make a uh, if, if you make a fly beyond a certain point, it's not gonna but if you, you limit it more by the mass, it's way I'm saying I don't know, but we know the flies are up to a certain size, I mean, like like this size compared to the software. There's at least a lot of difference between the, the software size and the large fly. So, so Gerald, I think that you could apply the same framework to airplanes. You're walking. You you have these several pattern generators in your spinal cord. We know that, like the thermal levels, and you have motor neurons in the spinal cord that have to go down to your feet, right, to create motions. And so that there are time delays there, and I think this should apply to that. Yeah. This is also coming on the later slide. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. Super fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have shown that it satisfies these goals. Takeaways. So this is something that uh, Terry kind of alluded to, which is that in our model, we have some pre-programmed pre -programmed behavior learned on data, and that's uh, perturbation free, right? So we have that, like we can call it a pre-programmed behavior or baseline walking. So walking without too many perturbations. And it turns out that you don't need to learn walking in a bunch of different perturbations. You have your baseline behavior. And with the optimal controller, that'll take care of perturbations for you. So it's performing a sort of generalization. And this is perhaps reminiscent of how animals are in real life, right? You can encounter a new terrain or new, you know, environmental perturbations, and they respond decently well, sometimes even when they've never seen the perturbation. So you need something like reflex or optimal control to take care of that uh, projection for you. Second takeaway is that. Again, we've used control theory here, right? Control theory is control theory to facilitate insight on signaling delays. Typically in existing models, a lot, what have, a lot of what we found is that the model is great and then you add delay and then it, it works not at all, because, especially in the tuned controller settings. Um, so it's kind of important that you bake delay into your formulation instead of starting with a model and then saying, okay, what if we had delay? Bad things happen. The third, and I didn't really talk about this, but what we found in dealing with delay is that you need some kind of compensatory prediction. So let's say we have a motor delay of 30 milliseconds, right? That means that I say I'm gonna do this now, but I'm only gonna do it 30 milliseconds into the future. You should know what the world is gonna look like in 30 milliseconds because that's when your action is going to be deployed. So some kind of either implicit or explicit um, compensation needs to happen. In our model, I think we explicitly do a prediction, but it's possible that biomechanics are designed to do some kind of implicit uh, compensation. And for engineers, this framework, nothing about it has to be specific to a simulated model. You could just well try to use it and produce some kind of biomimetic gate, right? Replace the dynamics with an actual robot and try to track the uh, data from a robot. And that is the end of the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Control. Okay. Uh... That was a really nice talk that we just saw. Fantastic. This talk is going to be has no computational neuroscience in it. It's all just pure experimental perception and robotic control. And a lot of it took place here at the workshop over the last 15 years or so. And I thought some of you, many people have seen some of these robots before. And um, it ties directly into our current efforts to do neural control with more advanced neural network methods. Uh, but I'm going to show you now in this talk that it's possible to handcraft a lot of robots that have produced very convincing performance um, and handcraft perception to do convincing performance. You don't always have to use a neural network, except if you want to move forward now, you do have to use a neural network. So that's the story. Well, you know, that's how the brain works, too. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I, I'm not a roboticist and I'm not a theorist. I'm basically um, a hardware guy. At many different levels. And I really enjoyed building all these robots. And I hope you can I can share that enjoyment with you today. So let me turn on the laser here too. Okay, so basically the first thing is this robot goalie. So I'm gonna ask you a question. If you want a block ball shot at the goal, 
of course, that was done during the year of the World Cup here. But I was watching Fusball right on TV. On TV, right. In fact, during the lecture, half the people in the audience were watching the World Cup in the back of the room. But if you wanted to block the ball shot at this goal, how would you do it? You have a camera and you want to block the balls. Simple, right? You just have to track the balls, and they're already constrained on this two-dimensional surface. So if you can see the ball in the um, picture, you know, if you can see the ball from this camera in the picture, you know exactly where it is in 3D space. So you can measure the position and velocity of the ball, and you know how to put your arm in the right place in the picture. So you have to learn the map between the motor command and the motor output, you should be able to solve this problem. And that's what we did in this robot rolly uh, by taking a DBS event camera that produces these brightness changes and um, just running a little bit. And it has one servo motor and a paint stick from the hardware store the original silicon red, and there you can see the tracking going. You can see the balls being tracked by this event-driven tracker, and the bottom tracker here. Let's see some real action. Uh, but you have to be fair, you know, hits you more than once. Most the balls are white and yellow. You know, the cable is yellow. Will this be really work? The glee, the glee, and, and this thing was not that hard to write. Uh, basically, it's just a procedural program in Java. I'm not going to explain how that works here, but it's just a very simple cluster-based tracker. And then it knows how to it knows to predict where where the ball is going to cross the goal line, right? So it can put the arm in that to try to block it. Very simple. Anybody in this room can write it. It's, it's running off of a, a laptop. Yeah, it's running on a little laptop. And because the uh, the events are coming from the camera in these little USB packets within a millisecond, you know, the compute delay is like basically unmeasurable, a few microseconds. And then you have to send it back out to the server one, and that's another millisecond. So we actually measured round trip latency around three milliseconds. Just on the cheapest laptop. I mean, you could run it on a phone easily or even a microcontroller. Yeah, because of the fact that the, uh, the uh, tracking is yeah. activity driven. So, you know, when there's no boss coming, there's no tracking and so you basically can go to sleep. So that was really fun to play with. Now it did have a learning component. Do you know what the learning is? So when nobody's shooting at it, once in a while they would like move the arm around and track it. And then it would learn the map from the servo control to the arm position in visual space. So it did a little bit of mode of learning, like motor babbling to learn this map. Okay, so that was the first robot. Then we got a bit fancier with the laser goalie. So this goalie here, not only uh, blocks so the balls. So this is a demo laser goalie. Right now the laser goalie is sleeping. If I shoot, it'll wake up. And you notice that the laser beam actually tracks the ball as it's coming in. You can shoot quite hard here. And the laser, the goalie should still block the ball. Controlling the arm and the laser. Uh, pan tilt. And it turns the laser beam on and off, and it's all powered from USB. Let's see if we can beat it. So far, I haven't managed to score yet. Uh, so, again, you have to do some learning here. Right? It's more complicated. You have to learn the map from this two dimensional pan cell unit. So, the laser spot, when they say, How do we do that? We flash the laser beam on and off, again, from USB. So we'll allow this to track it, and then we can learn this uh, simple uh, matrix map from, the, from this pan tail servo for the laser. Yeah. How long, how much learning needs to be done? Just a, uh, maybe 10 seconds of moving the beam around, you know, Sorry. and then fit a, fit a plane to it. Question. If the surface has some... Wouldn't work. You have to be that more complicated. Mm -hmm. Everything here is constrained on this flat table. Okay. Yeah, that's why. If you can see the individual space, you know where the ball is. Also, we tried, I don't have a video of this, but we tried to stereo a pair of cameras. So the ball's bouncing, you could be able to track it. That was all working. At the final demo, it didn't work at all. You know why? Because by the time the demo came around, the two camera timestamps were unsynchronized. And so it thought that the, you know, there was a delay between the depth 
and uh, stereo delay problem, right? So, you know, in other words, there's a confusion between time and uh, visual disparity. There's actually a famous illusion. Yeah. People like that it didn't work, right? Why does the laser goalie look better than the first robot goalie? In what way does it look better? Why does it work better? It doesn't work better. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't work better. It was just the idea to try to add another component of a finger pointing at the ball. Nice. Right. Yeah. What's the hardware that moves the laser beam? It's just a little two servo pan tilt unit that you can buy from the robot shop. Huh. And it's controlled also by USB. There's a little board that you know, takes the USB commands and generates the servo pulse width. So, so uh, I, what, I really like Mike Stryker because he always comes in and asks these hardware questions. <laughs> so the, uh, the other reason why it works is that you have very low inertia with that uh, paint stick. That, in other words, if you had a metal rod there, that was like, one thing. That was had to be a inertia. Was yeah, well, I still ran into problems. In fact, that was a, a drawback of these RC servos that you don't have control of the controller. It's open loop. And as soon as you add something with inertial load, it overshoots. And so one common failure mode was to go to the position, but overshoot a little bit. During the overshoot, the ball would pass by. <laughs> I think we saw some of this when we were doing the tooth ball controller. Uh, I saw that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he did a comfortable way. He had a fancier uh, Dynamix old, you know, robot servo that you have control over the PD um, control parameters, the damping and stuff. So, like so there's a lot of work that has been done modeling the aqua motor system with control theory. And no Martin, theory here, Terry. No, 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 because this is not a theory question. It's, it's the fact that we can do the same thing with our eyeball because the eyeball has very low inertia as opposed to your arm. Yeah, yeah that's true. There's something uh, that we that your Conrad uh, conceived, and together with Matthew Cook, they, they developed this pencil balancing robot. You ever try to balance a pencil on your hand? Humans can't do it, right? You can balance them on your nose. You can train yourself to balance them on your nose if you're quick enough. But you know, we like to do things that humans can't do. And so we actually brought this to tell you right back in 2018. Is that right, Antonio? Well, oh, Antonio is moving the stuff from our condo right now. Okay. Uh, so here's a pencil balancer. It's actually over in that bathroom over there. Uh, I'm running. But this video is terrible. So it's a lot of light. I'm gonna play it in the evening. You can see it balancing that pencil there. Yeah, the way it works is there is a tracker in each of those cameras. In fact, the whole visual process is embedded in the microcontroller that's on the board on each of those white sticks. 32 bit microcontroller back in 2008. And um, it tracks the. So when the pencil moves around, it makes. That's a huge delay, man. Okay, it's about three second delay. So there's a, uh, you know, you can there in space, and as it wiggles around, it makes this kind of fan of brightness change events in space time. So what you have to do is, from each point of view, estimate the angle and position of this pencil from the two eyes. So now you know where it is in 3D space. And what you want to do is get vertical, just like the card pole, right? So what, what uh, uh, your Conrad here, did is he developed a little proportional derivative controller on each axis that would stabilize the pencil. And so the Kramer microcontroller estimates the pencil position and slope with an event-driven huff tracker that Matthew Cook developed. I don't have time to talk about it here, but it's a very cool algorithm, not, not obvious at all. And then the control is actually completed on the third microcontroller. Well, here we are in Kyoto. No, it's totally frozen, okay. Yeah, so this, I took this around, this is in Tokyo here, it's at my friend's apartment. And uh, that's Rin there, when he was quite young. And this thing really just worked. You know, you had to get it going at first. But again, it was very standard control, totally procedural uh, code, totally handcrafted perception, no machine learning. And in a moment here, you'll see the pencil estimate. In fact, you should be able to see it here, yeah. But it's a terrible light. You can see the estimate of the pencil uh, slope and angle kind of superimposed here. Eventually, it would fall down. Okay. This is not acceptable lag. There's, there's really something wrong. Okay, so now let's go to another robot first built here in, in Telluride. It's to beat humans again, but this time at the game of slot car racing. You know what a slot car racing? Anybody raise your hand if you don't know what a slot car racetrack is. You don't, you guys don't know slot car? <laughs> okay, you'll see it in the next video. Basically, it's a one-dimensional track. The only thing you can control is the power delivered to the car. 
the car is held into the truck by a little pin, but it can fly out of the truck. Trust me, as soon as you cram on the throttle, the first curve will just fly off the truck. And if you can see here, um, it's hopeless to use this laser pointer. As the car goes around and you're watching it from a DBS above, it makes this very, very sparse stream of brightness change events just from the car, like 5,000 events a second, right? Tiny data rate. Now, very clever idea uh, was conceived by uh, somebody from um, Davide Scaramucci's lab said, you know what, you want to ignore everything but the car on the track that you care about, but how do you do that? How can you pay attention only to the events that are coming from the computer controlled car? Anybody have an idea? Any, okay, so I didn't have the idea either, right? So maybe it's not obvious. You drive the car around the track with the computer, you collect those events, and now you only let events through pixels. Automatically, you ignore everything else. But now you can just track the car using those events. That allows you to track the computer control car, completely ignoring everything else, right? And so now, once you can track that computer control car, you can develop a policy. So this has actually had some learning in it. So at each point in the track, you're watching it with the kit, with the DDS, within a few milliseconds, three milliseconds or so, you know where the car is and you can apply a learn throttle to the car. And let me show you the video of that. This is uh, captured partly here in Telluride and partly in, um, in Sardinia. We're here in Capacaccia 2014. I'm uh, Toby Delbrook with Mark Oswald, and we're going to demonstrate the, um, the slot car racer project from this year. The slot car racer is a game where we have a track uh, in which uh, little cars run in these little slots here, and the car has a magnet on the bottom that holds it on the track, and this little pin on the front of the car goes in the track, and then the car picks up power using these two brushes here. Uh, and then the human driver has a throttle, which they press to control the amount of power. And by that means, they can control the speed as they're going around the track. Now, on this track, a decent human driver will do about four seconds uh, per lap. Now, this is the, the white car is a human-controlled car. If the car crashes, you have to pick it up and put it back in. So now let's put on the computer-controlled car, which is being tracked by this camera you see right here. It's uh, the latest Davis uh, 180 by 180 DVS uh, pixel sensor, which is tracking the cars from the ceiling, uh, the eye of God view, and now it's, it's controlling the car according to the instantaneous place that the car is in the track. You can observe what's going on here. If you look at the car over here on this edge of the track, you'll see that the red car applies these huge bursts of throttle and then braking on the straightaways and the curves. Now the red car is actually catching up with the black one. Oh, they both crashed. The computer controlled car on this track achieves about three and a half seconds, 3.2 seconds sometimes, as little as 3.1 seconds per lap. So let's, let's do a real race. On the word go, the two cars are gonna start off and try to do 10 laps first. On your marks, get set, go. The red car is computer controlled, the white car is human controlled. Oh. The car's almost crashed out there. The red car is in the lead. I think it's lap number three already. Oh, will the human be lapped? The red car is catching up. That's the computer car. Yep, nope, it's just about to lap. The human's staying ahead heroically. <laughs> oh, the human crashed out. Bummer. So you can see how it works here, uh, using the DVS up in the ceiling. Um, when the moving, when the car goes around the track, it produces these events, uh, which are processed to track the car. In this case, this is Mark controlling the, the human control car. The data rate is extremely low here. You can see it; it's, it doesn't even measure on this scale. Now, there's a model of the track, which if I turn it on here, you'll see it. As the uh, car drives around, it's tracked along this computer control, this uh, track here. And at every point in the track, the computer applies a throttle setting to the car, which is proportional to the size of the blue dot here. The X's here are where the computer applies electronic braking that shorts the motor. And that's basically how it works. Uh, you, you go and you draw, as a coach of your car, you go and draw your throttle 
settings and your brake settings and you try to get the car to drive as quickly as possible around the track. And at the moment, the computer car just crashed for some reason, we don't know why. But it typically achieves um, yeah, times that are really competitive compared to humans. Because uh, these points here come along about every 5 or 10 milliseconds, and every 5 or 10 milliseconds the throttle is updated. So, so okay. does this depend on the human? I mean, if someone practices this, wouldn't they get better and better? They get better and better, but they can never beat us. In fact, we ran this thing at um, uh, one of the uh, big computer vision conferences, ECDB, that was held in Zurich, and we had to add a policy that when the computer car got ahead, it slowed itself down. <laughs> Otherwise, it's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this is predates. I added a little bit of uh, reinforcement learning here. This is not like deep neural network reinforcement learning, but I added randomly at various points in the track, according to the curvature of the track, a little increase of throttle. You know, just increase the throttle a little bit before this curve here. You keep increasing and it keeps going faster and faster. If it crashes, you throw that away. You throw away that whole change. Keep changing this thing. And then by random search, you know, it gradually get faster and faster. And how do you detect a crash? Well, you have to stop tracking it. So it had to like detect the track, the, the fact that it was a crash eventually. It's not so simple, actually. It turned out the hardest part. But it's a very simple reinforcement learning policy. Actually, in practice, humans are much smarter. They say, oh, I think the car needs to go a little faster, just like Formula One. You know, the guy says, okay, you can put a little more throttle here, you know? So that was my fun project. I wouldn't call this uh, robot. Now I want to show you the robot last year, from last year's Tiger Ride. You guys are not here last year. You know, fly fishing is really big in this town. You can hire a fly fishing crew to take you out there. What is fishing? What is fly fishing? It's a perfect case of reinforcement learning with very uncertain right, you keep that fly, you have to go at the right time of the day and so on. This is a very simplified version of this using this gone fishing game where you have to, uh, children, you know, this, thing, this game's been in production for 45 years straight. And what you have to do is catch these little fish. I'll just play the video for you. Again, totally handcrafted. Fishing is hard. And the hook swings <laughs> back up and very precisely into the mouth of the fish just a moment before it snaps closed. There we go. I got one. How do we see the fish? Come on, I have God camera. First, we mask out the middle of the pond, <laughs> then we denoise, and then we track the fish using these circular objects where events on the rim of the disc drag along the fish. And when the fish crosses this region of interest, we can trigger the fishing motion at the right time. Yeah. Here's one more example. You see the orange fish there? It crosses the ROI. It lets us plan the fishing motion to catch the fish. How do we detect a catch? The rod pushes down on this force sensitive resistor and we can easily detect the change in the conductance in the ADC output sent to the computer. We still miss pretty often. When we miss, it's usually because the timing is not quite right. This is where the reinforcement learning comes in, because it can slightly vary the timing and the angle of the fishing rod right. every time, right? Yeah. Depending on I mean, it can improve the accuracy up to about 15, 20 percent. So gun fishing has been a lot of fun to work on. All the code is open source, and maybe somebody else can take it to the next level. Thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah. So actually, you can only get to about 20 percent success rate. It depends exactly on the fish with the angle and so on. But in the end, it was quite fun to work on it. But again, it's handcrafted. It has a little bit of reinforcement learning. Do you see what it was? Every time you try, you vary slightly the angle of the fishing rod and the timing to when you think you should draw it. You know, because the, predict, the fish speed is very predictable. And, you've, and I've already programmed by hand the fishing motion. You know, with the, with the mouse, I can program the fishing motion that starts from the rest point of the rod. So there's a little, there's a little like wall. That the, that the fish hook goes up against that damps out all the swinging, which is you can't control the swing at all. So then it, then it does a minimum jerk movement over to the fishing point and drops the rod down at the moment. It has to be within about 15 milliseconds. Has to drop the hook in to the fish at that moment that you predict that it should come along. Right? Totally handcrafted, no machine learning. Okay. 20% is still a lot better than any of us did. 
<laughs> well, humans are pretty good, but they, remember, human can move the rod, move the thing along the fishing track, right? Only here, I could only move it laterally across the fishing track up and down. Right? Quite robustly, whether it worked or not, the success rate. So maybe if somebody wants to continue. You can buy this game here for about 10 bucks at Walmart. School. <laughs> it's still popular. It's good for drunken parties, especially. <laughs> Now, let me go to something where we actually had to use some machine learning. That's the game of uh, Rochambeau or um, Yunkin or Rock, Scissors, Paper, right? So we wanted to beat humans at this guessing game, Rock, Scissors, Paper. So, uh, Lisa, how can I guarantee to beat you every time at Rock, Scissors, Paper? Guarantee. Every single time you do it, one, two, three, I can beat you. How can I guarantee it? Can you know what time I was going to do? What's that? Oh, you can wait until I've already done it and then just. I can just be really cheat. fast. I can cheat and be. It's not cheating because it's a physical form. Not <laughs> so we turn it into a physical sport by watching you in super slow motion. I can see you start to throw the paper, the scissors, the rock. <laughs> just put the symbol to be. You have to be able to modify your response at that speed. Also. Of course, you could always do like. <laughs> so anyway, this is the first case, uh, actually probably the second case where we drove a CNN, very small CNN uh, with DBS frames, so accumulated event counts, frames, but there were constant count frames. In other words, each frame had 3,000 events in it. So if you move the hand slowly, the frames come along at a few hertz. If you move the hand really fast or shake it, the frames come along at a kilohertz, right? So it's activity driven. We take the frames, we drive that into a little CNN, a little net. The optimal net is four classes, right? Boxes, paper, and one other class is very important. Everything else, right? that's the hardest class actually. So here's the video of that. Rock, scissors, paper, rock, rock, scissors. Here it's tiger, it's programmed to tiger. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Scissors. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Bravo. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Somebody in the background there before, you know. Okay, uh, so this was very straightforward thing. How did we totally supervise training, right? We trained a little CNN. How did we how did Yulia, Yulia Young Lungu, the way she collected the data was she had 20 people each go. And she said, look, for one minute, just do rock. With the right hand, another minute with the left hand, all positions, all sizes. And you know, collected a big data set. It was always already automatically labeled by the fact that, you know, they said they were doing rock, right? And they were doing scissors. Millions and millions of frames, literally, like three. And it took that much. To really get it to work, it took that much real data to get it to work. Because she kept coming to me and saying, oh, it should work. I tried, it wouldn't work. But in the end, it really worked. People could wear watches, they could wear coats, they could put the scissors and rock. I'll demonstrate it for you later. You could put it at all different scales. The size of the symbol could vary by a factor of 100, you know, area, and it would still recognize you. And it's quite a cool demo, and we're planning to make that in a museum exhibit. In fact, we're constructing right now a new hand. This hand here is uh, from AliExpress. It costs about 100 bucks, but it, it's uh, really flaky. And so we have a new hand. Uh, for this museum exhibit that's tendon driven, it should be much better. But totally an exercise in supervised learning. Now, here is one that I had a lot of fun with during the lockdown. It's called Trixie. How many people know about it? Okay, a few people know about it. Okay, basically, here's the, oh, that, I'm down my prop. He wants to be the subject. Anyway, I'll take it. So the effect is, and you'll see it in a moment. Uh, that, um, you know, I just have somebody take a card from the deck, like mine, and you take a card, I show it to the computer, you can hold it up for everybody to see. <laughs> the Joker in the pack. Joker. <laughs> happens to be Joker. <laughs> and then, uh, you, you don't see the moment. Let's see if it works. How the Joker is going to text. Trixie is a card magic uh, robot. It's a card finding robot. Mm -hmm. So Trixie is a very simple robot. So I, I take a deck of cards here. 
and your job is now to help me with this trick uh, by taking a card and then we're going to show it to Trixie so Trixie can learn it and then Trixie will try to find it again. So take a card okay. or this one. Okay, wait. Now look at that card. Look at that card. Show it to the camera. Okay. <laughs> no, that's a good card. <laughs> show it now. Show it to Trixie. Trixie doesn't know it yet. Come back here a bit, Trixie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Trixie, Trixie likes that card. Okay, Trixie has now learned that card. Okay. Now take that card and put it back anywhere in the deck. Now you shuffle the cards. You're not really a card player, are you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, that's the kind of subject I like. Does it make it easier for Trixie? Or? Okay, that's good enough. You're happy that the cards are mixed? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, I'm your happy. card, your, yeah. your hidden secret card, yeah. which only Trixie knows and you guys, um, has to be found. Now let's see, let me ask you now, if I look through the cards like this, can you see your card anywhere? I saw it, yeah. You saw it? I saw it, yeah. I mean, it's somewhere in here, right? Yeah, yeah, but I saw it. I don't know where it is. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now, here's what you do. As the cards go by, stick your finger in exactly at your card. Ready? Hold your finger out like okay, this. Okay, okay, okay. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Come on, man. It's difficult, Just stick man. Your, stick your finger in there. No, no, I can't do it. Okay, let's yeah. see if what Trixie can do. Yeah. Okay, are you ready, Trixie? Are you ready, Trixie? Damn it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Trixie stops exactly at this card. Yeah, Is that's that the card? card. Yes, yes, let's show it to the camera. That's my card. Yeah. Trixie is better than me. Be <laughs> where you like. Thank you. As I, as... Okay, so you see the secret here, right? So, first, it's essential. This is basically run by a little CNN. Actually, here's the thing right here. There, there's a camera. It sees the cards coming by. Again, constant count frames, 3K events per frames. But now 224 by 224 images. They come up to a kilohertz frame rate, right? Because if you riffle the cards like that, you get a lot of events. And now this network is laboriously, we've hand labeled the frames. I mean, I spent two weeks in my bed labeling frames here, right? Joker, non-joker. The secret is that it only detects jokers and everything else. And I force the joker. Like I knew, Mike. I, did this. I forced the joker on you. And now the network is really simple. It has to be a lightweight dark period that has very quick inference because when the cards go by in about one second, 1001, so 50 cards, the cards only present for about 20 milliseconds. So you have to see that card and stick the finger out with a, a solenoid. Actually, the solenoid is driven by about 40 volts on ultra gap. <laughs> Just shoots the finger out as quick as possible. It has to happen within 20 milliseconds, right? Because if Joker appears, and you have to like stick the finger out. And you can see the network here has 700k parameters. It takes about 2 million operations per uh, frame here. And it takes on the GPU, uh, it takes about 3 milliseconds to do the inference. So that leaves you about 15 milliseconds to actually shoot the finger out. In the end, after training, you, know, you get this good. Decent um, you know, confusion matrix where it detects non Joker and Joker rather well, and it doesn't make too many false positives. But very straightforward. It doesn't learn anything now. It's handcrafted. Now, handcrafted control, if you call it control, there's no feedback control, it just shoots it out at the right moment. Okay, question. Yeah. In principle, it can be done for any card, right? In principle, you could learn the card just by showing it, and you could do incremental learning, and you know, you could have learned all the cards. Actually, it's quite difficult because it's much harder. This probably much harder than it looks because after the GDS actually produces an after image because when it sees a card, a different card comes. So the image you actually get is the difference between those two frames. It looks. Also, the camera doesn't see the red very well; it sees the black. You know, so it's uh, you know, Joker is particularly easy. So what, why do you say chance is 50%? No, if you just did it uh, blind, joker, non joker, you just have 50% chance, right? But in the end, it got very high accuracy, this network on training data. In practice, it never works as well. Okay. Okay, so this is a really cool project, I think. This, we were working at that time, Chi Chi and I, and our, and our students in the neuromorphic cluster project, Samsung project, we were working on incremental learning. 
we thought, you know, this is a great chance to try and see if incremental learning that was like high curl actually work. And so we took this Rosham Bogay and Julia Lungo again and implemented an incremental learning version of it. So we had an elk that's pre trained for boxes of paper and background. And we wanted to show Samson that we could learn a new symbol right when they were there for the demo. And so I'll play the demo first and then I'll explain a little bit about it. This is YouTube, I hope it works. Okay, so right now we're collecting data for retraining the existing Rochelle Bow network. And the CNN is again driven by this constant count. We have to move around in different positions and sizes, as, many, as much variety as possible, but always keeping the hand there with that symbol. In this case, the symbol is, uh, I don't know what the name of that is. Antonio symbol. A flying, a flying bird or something. That's flying bird. That's Antonio symbol. Okay. And one more symbol, too. Oh. Okay, and you need as many sizes, position, angle, and scale as possible with the arm in there. Long and prosperous. That's it. That's the whole training data, right, for this new symbol. And now she goes in and makes exemplars out of those. She reduced them to like 4,000 examples that rest over the span of space. And uh, we start the training with this iPhone method on the whole data set. After about three minutes, we come back. Hello. And now who is it? Yeah, Anto Antonio can go and test his gestures. Uh, and you should start maybe with the base gestures. Okay. Right. See if it still does. It still work? Does it still work with the base gesture? Base. You see it's that scissors, scissors, right? That's correct. Can you see the scissors there? The label scissors in the middle? Yeah. Paper. The golden test. Dog. 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 Try That's a different size, maybe? Smaller? You make still sure recognize scissors? Still recognizing dog, 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 dog. Scissors now. And what's your name, Mr. Paper. Okay. Yes. Bravo. That's cool. It probably won't work with me, right? It has never seen me. I, I, I don't dare. Somebody else try the Antonio symbol. Let's break it. Let's, let's try to break it. Wow. And scissors? Dog. No, dog. Dog. And then scissors. Paper. So we got the sound to really work. Yeah. You're saying great. You're saying incremental learning. And paper still do paper. Real paper. 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 Spread the fingers. Yeah. Paper. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, this is a, the same Lynette, but now we've added new symbols to its to its uh, new outputs. You know, for the new symbols. Again, this uh, CNN has about 100k weights. About takes about 20 mega ops per frame to run it, and it's trained with this um, incremental learning method. Uh, let me turn off this laser here. Just a moment. Yeah, rather than actually. I'm six, and now we go to lunch. <laughs> uh, this is, how many people know iCrawl? Yeah, I don't remember what it stands for. Do you remember shoot you what it stands for? Yeah, anyway, it's one of the popular methods for doing incremental training, right? It's not continual learning. You incrementally add new classes to an existing network. In this case, it reduces the original data set to like 4K exemplars per class compared to the original 700,000. And those exemplars best span the dot product space of the, of the class. When we collect the new training data, we just take like 4,000 samples of those. We do supervised learning on all those. And actually, in this particular example, it worked really well, really worked. And it takes to require GPU training, but only like uh, three minutes to make our work well. Now, none of this is like what we're seeing here. Uh, you know, I show this again, the thing's so beautiful. This is real natural computation. That is natural computation, yeah. As someone who's particularly For this, for example. Monkey, come. Here. Also, come, 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 come. come. Dogs been, you know, learn to do parkour, train to do parkour, and walk on ropes. So how long did the dog so and all train? Go, 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 Let's go, 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 come on, come on, come on. Yeah, good boy. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, there's something wrong. The dog can even walk along the wall with the back feet against the wall. Yeah, this one here, I think, this would actually work. This lovely um, uh, baboon. Watch this move at the end here. 
Watch this right here. Oh, I can't see it. <laughs> okay, that's real. That's what we want to target more towards, right? Everything is well and well controlled, and we're not going to get there, uh, you know, just hand crafting things. About the same time, we started working on deep neural networks that are activity driven, like spiking neural networks in the, our neuromorphic processor project. Uh, we developed a multi generations of uh, CNN accelerators and RNN accelerators. And in fact, on a Saturday morning, um, Chang is standing here. Yeah, yeah. yeah Chang is going to give a talk about their work on uh, these kind of event-driven or activity-driven RNN accelerators. Really lovely work. I highly recommend it. The whole idea is to get away from, you know, computing all the pixels on every frame. And instead, uh, do a sparse kind of DNN inference. You still go layer by layer, but you just update the neurons that need to be updated or use the weights that need to be updated. And if that connection is zero, don't bother updating. Right? I just want to show one thing that I think is very cool from Chang's work, which inspired the work that we're now doing in our hardware uh, accelerated optimal control. Um, by the way, this, this uh, project ended up in the first NPU that went into Samsung's um, Exynos smartphone processors. They developed a CNN accelerator that explains weight velocity be a lot faster. And they do. On your modern Samsung smartphone, uh, the CNN does about 30 different workloads, you know, uh, uh, photo improvement, video improvement, speech enhancement, stuff like that. Okay, anyhow. Chang's thing is uh, an implementation of a, a, uh, an RNN accelerator that exploits temporal sparsity. Basically, it's the concept is the delta network. You only update the downstream neuron if the neuron activity changes by more than the threshold number down. So it's like a spiking neural network. We still do it layer by layer, but only the neurons that are actively changing update the downstream targets. And Chang implemented this in a very concrete form in this little mini Z. Let me hide this. This little mini Z, um, he implemented a lot of different uh, FPGA versions of it, but for me, the most beautiful is this mini Z version, which is a, a $90 FPGA board that burns just a couple of watts. And it, um, it only has a tiny bit of onboard memory, this VRAM. It has a lot of off-chip DRAM memory, which can store the weights of big neural networks, big RNNs. And RNNs you know, require a lot of weight memory because they're fully connected. So here is a very cool measurement that Cheng did. You're welcome to correct me if I make mistakes here. Comparing the latency per RNN inference over time, this particular audio network, which is running this rather large two layer 768 unit dated recurrent unit RNN at some uh, reasonable organization. I have to think 8 bit weight, 16 bit state, right? Uh, yes. 8 bit weight, 16 bit state, fixed point. So it has a lot of weights. You can't fit these in the on chip SRAM memory, they have to come from off chip DRAM which is way more affordable. Because of the architecture of this delta RNA, it reduces this off-chip dynamic random excess uh, by a factor of about five to 10. And it makes it possible to run this thing really quickly with predictable access of the DRAM. And this compares the latency per audio frame compared with the Jetson Nano, Jetson TX2, and GTX 1080 desktop GPU with HDRNN. You can see the HDRNN it's able to run this thing just as quick as a desktop GPU at a small, tiny fraction of the power budget. You can see the latency of the HDRNN varies depending on the sparsity of the data. So this is really cool, really a cool embedded RNN accelerator. And in fact, it was used in here in Telluride in 2018 for the, um, how do I fast forward here? The first time the thing was actually used for control here was in 2019 in, in a collaboration with uh, Rachel Gelhar from Aaron Ames Lab at Caltech for recurrent neural network control of a hybrid dynamic transfemoral prosthesis, basically uh, in ELA, uh, with the accelerator. And so what they did here, I'll just play the video for you. <laughs> this is Rachel with the ELA. The RNN accelerator there has been trained to imitate the original linear control. So we have the data from the original control, which Rachel implemented, and we train the RNN to imitate the controller. 
And you can see here, uh, Rachel, if you can't come here, you, know, you can't tell the difference. Let's see, let's see how much, uh, I don't know what that noise is. Some weird audio effect. Yeah, this is really terrible. Soon. It's totally frozen now. What lab is that, Ames? Is it Ames lab? Aaron Ames lab at Caltech, uh, the Amber lab. Okay. Yes. So you're imitating PD control with an RMN. Yes. Why? Just as cool that we could do it in this case. You'll see, you'll see in a, a minute or so that this really works well. Imitating in some existing controller, which might be extremely com computationally expensive, with the neural network is actually a very effective method. But PD control is very computationally expensive. Right. You'll see now. Okay. That was the very first time we ever did anything. I think it's a great accomplishment to do that here at the workshop. Actually, okay. So, um, so let me review nonlinear model predictive control just briefly here. Uh, there's a control sequence that you already have in mind. You know, you control a car, some throttle and steering sequence, and then there's some kind of model that predicts the future system dynamics from the past states in the control sequence. And then there's this model predicts the response to this control sequence in the future. And then using that control sequence, you can optimize. You use the model to explore possible future trajectories to find the optimum. You design the cost, what you want to achieve. This target is a thing we want to optimize for. For example, the minimum time to get around the track, the maximum distance, the maximum speed, uh, the fact that something's balancing upright, that you haven't hit the wall of the track, you haven't fallen down. You can put all kinds of stuff in this cost function. It's arbitrary. You compute it from the, uh, the history of the, of the output. Then you get a current control. You apply that to your plant, uh, like chemical plant or system. And then you get new data and you wrap around. This is really computationally expensive, uh, but it works. It's extremely effective, at least widespread. You know, many, most of the robots that you see, Segway, um, you know, all the, all the commercially produced robots, Boston Dynamics, they're all using MPC. Right uh, in the trained hands. Now, what we are very really excited about is trying to replace this neural network model with a deep, deep neural network, like a recurrent neural network. Right now, we can learn the model from data. You know, we don't have to write the ODE frames, which are never perfect. You know, maybe you can actually learn a better model. Of course, you have to be able to control it to get data. There's all kinds of pitfalls, and it may not generalize as we just saw from this lovely talk. So I wanted to show you one thing that we've done recently in this domain to give you a flavor of the kind of things that are interesting to us, which is called resampling parallel gradient descent. It's an optimizer for this model predictive control, which actually does a kind of stochastic gradient descent. And is everybody clear about this? You have to, at every time step, you have to find the, the best control policy over time, and then you just take the first step of that. So it's implicit feedback, right? So you're always at every time step solving a rather complicated optimization problem. This has had uh, you know, uh, 40 years now of development, and there are many sophisticated numerical methods, mostly developed for serial computers, not for neural networks, and not with parallel hardware in mind. So it's still worth revisiting it, uh, how to solve this. So this resampling parallel gradient descent method, it runs a small batch of rollouts, say like 32 rollouts of the future. And these rollouts are based on some plan of steering and throttle. And you sample around those rollouts, Right, to get a distribution of possible outcomes. So you're imagining possible futures. And then for each of those, you do here's the key thing, you do an atom gradient descent through the cost function onto the control. So since we know what the cost function is, we know what the dynamics of the system are, we can do gradient descent in real time to compute how to change the steering and throttle to improve each of these trajectories a little bit. This is done with TensorFlow uh, computation on a computed graph of computation. So when we have the whole system, neural network or ordinary differential equations, we ask TensorFlow, look, you compute the, the gradients through this whole system. It computes a big graph of computations, numerical computation. We just do a few steps, three or four steps of, of the gradient descent. Now we select, now we look at the all trajectories and we select an elite set. These are the ones that are best. We throw away the ones that suck. Right? There are some that are really bad. And then we draw new samples from those. And now we have a set of really nice trajectories. Now we finally choose the best one and take the first control action. 
Is it clear? Okay. The really cool thing about this is that it folds the gradient steps over time because the, these trajectories that are good get multiple gradient steps. Every time step, we add more gradient descent to them. We just add one new time value here at the front, but the rest of the steps remain the same. So this thing really works. Have a very small set of rollouts. Uh, we can control things like the car pull and the Formula One tenth car and lots of simulated systems. One thing, by, by the way, make, feel free to make comments here. And this is the work of a lot of masters and semester students uh, together with Marxian Marx and I. Okay, so let me show you one thing. Uh, this is my personal pilot. Yeah, it's rather selfish. Yeah. But this is the car pull dancer. It's exact, exactly computed by this uh, RPG model predictive control. And instead of having the car pull just balance itself, I wanted to do a real dance, like have a, a variety of dynamic steps. And so I, I uh, you know, made a dance to the tune of satisfaction. I hope this works. <laughs> That's intentional that it's doing this part real. Now it spins. That's the new step. That's intentional that there's a back and forth like that. Right. Okay, so for me, this is a lovely exercise that uses this RPG optimizer with model predictive control. But basically, it was an exercise in learning how to craft proper cost functions for model predictive control. And um, the model predictive uh, cost functions here for each of these steps are handcrafted to generate this desired behavior. Like balancing is easy, right? The cost function for that is just keep the angle zero and get the car in the right position. That's simple cost function, right? Dance, you have to follow a trajectory where the top of the pole stays in a particular place, but then the cart itself follows a particular state trajectory over time. And, and the optimizer tries to follow that spin. You just have to maximize the energy in the pole in one direction or the other. And these are state machines. These cartwheel to and fro are like state machines that tradition between different. Is this, is this too fast? Okay. Did you listen to the music that has adapted or you put it all around it? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, Canelli's asking, how uh, does it actually listen to the music? No, I just went through satisfaction. I got the seed of satisfaction. I identified the parts of the song and I wrote this uh, whole dance song and, and scripted it. Like a real dance choreographer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any problem by switching from balance and dance speed and changing the policy? No, you just switch the new policy, and right away the optimizer tries to achieve that new uh, policy. Okay. And it, 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 the rollout is about uh, uh, what rollout is about 0.8 seconds into the future. Without rollout, that horizon length mm -hmm. is enough to, to do all these all these policy. How many trajectories for how many trajectories did you roll out? How many trajectories? Yeah, so RPG only used 32 rollouts per time step. And it did, uh, I think, um, uh, it kept the elite uh, quarter of best trajectories, and it did, I think, five gradient descent steps per time step. So this thing runs, didn't need GPU, right? We couldn't actually get it to run on GPU. We just run a 100 watt CPU. This is, still takes a lot of power, 100 watt desktop CPU to run it. Now, let me finish here. I'm out of time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, how can you actually do better than optimal? You can do better than optimal control by just being quicker. That's Marcin's insight. So what we can do is now we can, this goes back to your point, we can train a neural network from the optimal controller, right? We use the optimal controller, which does the best thing that this car can possibly do by our definition of best, which is the class function. We can bring a very small neural network to imitate that controller. And in this video, I hope it plays. Um, oh, shoot. I, I, can't, I can't figure out how to. Let me just get out of this stupid. Oh, there we go. Okay. It should play now. So in this case, the car pole, which is just balancing, is actually controlled by directly by a neural network. The neural network takes the current state and generates the 
current acceleration directly. It's a very small. Stand up and say what it is, please, Martin. Uh, you mean multi-layer perceptron or? Yeah, it's a small multi-layer perceptron with like 60 units per layer, six, be, yes. 64 you. units per layer, two-layer multi-layer perceptron that takes a carpool, the six carpool state and generates the directly acquired acceleration. And you can see here on the right that compared with the, uh, it's just right here. This is time here, and this is the angle degree, just balancing it. You can see here that the neural network actually balances it much more accurately. See the angle is much closer to zero. It's like five times slower. Neural network is super cheap to compute, right? This little neural network can compute at a fraction of a millisecond. So just simply by controlling it faster, we reduce this time delay, this pesky time delay. And that's a lesson we learn over and over again. It's it's often better just to be faster and not smarter. So Toby is not fair and optimal, is optimal at a different uh, we've trained it to be optimal, right? We trained it from the optimal controller, but then just by running it much faster, we get much better. So the last thing that we're working on now, I think this is the end actually. This is what we're doing right now. This is the F110 car, which is actually on the way. I'm informed that I finally cleared customs after 12 days, and it should be here by Wednesday. And this is Florian, um, who is our very capable staff member who's helping us with this Formula 110 uh, race car competition. We actually competed in Formula 110 with a team of exactly two people, Martin and Florian, basically. And we managed to place in the very first time that we competed in the Ecuador Challenge, we got halfway up the field in the time trials, right? And then we got knocked out in the second round of the actual race. It was a great adventure, but a fantastic learning experience. But in this video here, you're gonna see, uh, this is in the hangar in uh, Dubendorf near, you know, near our institute. And I'll just play the video. So the, the most fast expert in autonomous driving is showing our obstacle avoidance and our trust into our algorithm. We are ready for London 2023. It's driving itself around the course. He's not controlling with the joystick. This thing is driving itself around the course, following a set of waypoints. Is it doing localization now? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's localizing it, so it knows where it is, and then it's it's uh, actually using a neural network, which is an input, um, not only from the desire to get set of points. Okay, uh, that's a video. Um, it's not a very great quality video, but that gives the idea. Actually, you can see the car avoiding Florian sitting in the track, and also the box is on the track. So, I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the previous example, you mentioned that it was faster than the and the differential equations solver, right? I have to use the, yeah. the, the previous for the carpool. Yeah. And why why was that? Is it because the uncertainties are too high or is it just the integration? Why was that slower than the neural network? Well, because this MPC computation is very expensive. It requires literally tens of millions or hundreds of millions of uh, arithmetic uh, floating operations, yeah, floating point operations per time step because of this optimization. You have to compute all the dynamics of the system through the system, either the neural network system or the automated differential equation. And then you have to run gradient descent on those. It's really expensive in America. So, then training from this is much, much cheaper. And we get a few thousand operations per time step. Let me explain how this is actually done now. I'll just finish here. There's a, a small neural network here. Uh, please, uh, Martin, I didn't have time to coordinate. This is a small neural network. It's uh, very tiny, MLP. Um, the input to this thing are the upcoming 15 waypoints, the desired positions and speed along the optimal line of the track. So we know what those are because we can compute the optimal line, just like the real form of the one team, right? They know what that is. And it has partial car state. It has the angular velocity of the car, the speed of the car, the steering angle, and it has the LiDAR scan. It was like a scan of the obstacles, the edge of the track, Florian sitting in the track, the distances, like a one dimensional distance vector. This thing now trains in simulation, as you'll see in a minute, um, to generate the appropriate output, which is the steering command and the throttle command to the car. And uh, this is trained on a data set of simulated driving. We'll have a rather accurate model of the car. Um, you know, this is trained on simulated data from the model predictive controller, RPGD controller. Using, uh, I don't know what this 20,000 data points means. I think it's bigger than that. It's a bunch of different tracks and driving around the track with a very small number of epochs and this, and this learning right here. 
And the simulation training data looks like this. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I think you can see here the car is driving around the track, it's sliding, um, and it's getting all the distance information from the simulated LIDAR, and it's rolling out these trajectories here. The small number of rollouts that are doing these dots here, these are the time points, and then it's controlling itself to drive around the track. We feed all this data in to train the neural network to imitate what the MTC does. And so that's how that I, I control um, actually works. You can't guarantee anything, right? So you memorize what you do fast. Yeah, we basically memorize it. You could use hyperdimensional computing. You could use any kind of neural network. We would like no, to use no, no, no network, just the stage. Well, that's still a network of some kind. It's still a computation, right? Yeah. It's faster. But we like neural network because we can build the accelerators for them. And we have the RNN accelerator. In fact, we're hoping right now to see whether the state in the RNN is useful for um, you know, storing information about the system, the friction of the track, things like that. And we're also very interested in whether the model mismatch can be used to continually update the model. Because at every time step you take an action, there's a mismatch between your efferent copy of what you think happened and what you actually measure. And you can use that potentially continuously to update the weights or the states of your neural network. You better predict the future. Yeah, I think the information, I think this whole area is very exciting. I'm almost done here. Um, you know, we are very much amateurs in this business of optimal control and robotics, uh, but we are experts in neural network hardware. And so we want to put that stuff together and work with other groups who are more expert in these areas. The infrastructure to run these big robots, because trust me, one lab or one, one student is not going to learn how to run, run one of these big multi-dimensional robots. It takes an entire lab to get expertise for these big robots. And so we need to collaborate. Yes, Tim. Um, so you just mentioned that you know like the exact um, best desired position and speed of that 15 waypoint, but why is there like multiple trajectories? Yeah, those are the rollouts of the optimizer. This is stochastic gradient. So these are the rollouts that See, it's saying, if I steer a little bit left, I'm going to crash here. If I steer a little bit right, I'm going to crash. It samples at every time step a bunch of different possible steering and throttle trajectories. And then it finally chose this, uh, you don't want, you can't really see it, it's a yellow one. That's the one it actually chose at that time step. And then it applies the control action corresponding to that. That's how NPC works, this kind of stochastic gradient descent yeah. NPC. Is it clear to me? Um, but um, I, I'm kind of confused about the, Process of choosing since of you already knows like where you should go. So why just why don't you just like um try to make your predicted as close to the um desired uh, position as possible? Make your predictions. Maybe somebody else can answer. I don't understand. I, I don't think you do know exactly what your position should be because you need to do the rollouts. You don't know exactly where on the track and what speeds you should be at in order to do that. Uh, yeah, we, have a, we have a plan. We have a plan for how to go run. This is not a realistic track. We, but for real tracks, there's always offline computed uh, minimum curvature trajectory around the track, a path that we need to, that we know that we should follow to get the minimum time around the track. Now we get the waypoints of that optimal trajectory and we simply try to follow it with model predictive control. Right. We could follow it by a variety of other methods, but in this case, model predictive control, assuming that we have a good car model, now we know the friction of the track and everything will do a very good job of following that trajectory. Even, even if there's a disturbance to the car, it'll get back onto it. As long as the disturbance is not too big. If we get a really big disturbance, the sampling won't find a way back on. I mean, maybe one, one more point to verify is that you cannot just draw a trajectory and uh, follow it because uh, the dynamics of your robot in this case your car is constrained which uh, which trajectory you are uh, able to follow right so so we, we have this approximate path we want to follow which is the line of minimal curvature uh, but this line is not necessarily at, at each point uh, followable by by the car and because of it we need also this planning from another uh, side is that we start with control input we see this trajectory uh, results of it and, and we then correct this control inputs to get possibly best trajectory. This is one thing. And second thing, yeah, things to happen like like the obstacle, which is not part of the map, with the ultimate car. Uh, second, also because of model mismatch and and your 
it finds the measurement yes, of your current state. I think maybe there's a confusion because your slot car demo was saying I am God, and then you say I don't know. Yes, here the car is estimating the here. Uh, the question is how the car estimates on state. I'm talking about it off. It has a whole complicated slam pipeline that takes these lidar measurements, accelerometer, and fuses them together so that it can estimate not only where it, where it is, but also, yeah, it can estimate where it is and how fast it's moving and what direction on the map. So it lear we learn the map using SLAM, and then continuously, every time step, there is an estimation pipeline, SLAM, that uses, uh, or particle filter, that uh, localizes the car. It gives us a rather noisy estimate, but an amazingly good estimate of where the car thinks it is at that time. That's part of the state. It's a very noisy state measurement. Okay. Just want to show you this is the final point here. If we run this RPGD optimizer, it's the expensive optimizer on a laptop, it takes about 30 milliseconds per time step to do it. But um, and we can run this, um, but we can run the uh oh my gosh. But what if we run the network on the laptop, it only takes about two milliseconds to compute. It's like many times faster to do the inference. So we can actually control it at a much higher rate. Actually, we can even run this network on the embedded computer on the car, you know, much, much faster than the optimal control. That's the point. All right, so this is the network actually running on the car computer. So how far, does, it, how far does a car move in 30 milliseconds? Depends how fast it's going, but this car is really fast. It'll go up to like 40 kilometers an hour. We never run it that fast. I mean, it really pulls ass. You I know, see. if you run this car like at full speed, like one time it, uh, the throttle got stuck on the ETH car, it ran down the entire hangar and smashed it into the wall at very high speed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the car is high performance. Yeah. It's not one of these creeping around robots, right? Yeah. Although in our hands, it may creep around. Oh, you're at 25. Yeah, anyway, that's it. Uh, I just wanted to give you this nice taste of all the different robots and what we're trying to do here moving towards the future. Thank okay. you. We started late, so I think we, we deserve a few minutes of questions here. And I'll start off. Uh, I'd like to make a connection with Lisa's uh, you know, line model. Right? She, she also started off you know, by training a network on, on the actual data, the fly data, so you can yeah. reproduce it. I think that's what you started out doing, right? You have, you have a simulation of a the dynamics of the of the car and, and you train the network to do to do that, right? So the I'd like to train these neural network models. In fact, um, we've had the most successful with very small multilayer perceptrons. They just take the current state and the current control and predict the next time step. And we trained that on simulated data. We also had real data. And that works really well, amazingly well for these low dimensional systems, which you know we are building here. We're not we're not building a multi-legged uh, robot that's interacting with the real world on slippery surfaces. You know, it's really simple what we're doing. But still that works really well, except if there's model mismatch. Like if the car, if you train such a network on a car on uh, the asphalt of this uh, hangar. And then bring it in here, it's not going to work at all. The friction here is like 10 times lower, right? It'll just slide all over the place. So, but you know, in general, um, what we're doing is rather simple minded now, I would say. Marcin, would you agree? In some, in some sense, we're um, taking the baby steps in this direction. We're not doing sophisticated policy based reward learning. You know, we're not quite in that space yet. So it will be interesting to hear from Lisa this afternoon because we yeah. achieved her insights. But yes, I mean, it's a different world. Yes, yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. It's it, look, the the the, uh, the world are are different right now, but in the future they may be converging. Okay. So any other questions? Boy, you, you put everybody to sleep. Oh, there's a question here. Go ahead. So if you like, you're saying about the slippery, right? Uh, what the system could uh, kind of stabilize itself if you would run into this process. Like with the with the with the learned controller, if the parameters are changing, right? Of the of the environment. If it wouldn't work. Why if, if imagine it's for example, we haven't created to generalize over many different uh, environments, say pole wings or friction levels. Now we can certainly do that, but then it would really pay for the network to be stateful. We use a stateless. MLP, it doesn't have any memory, it has to infer implicitly those environmental conditions from 
the last time step or the last couple of time steps. The, the hope is that uh, the network with memory will uh, learn to represent these environmental conditions within its own uh, activation. But shouldn't it, like imagine it would run 100 times faster? Yeah, we can do the control much cheaper. Wouldn't it solve itself? Well, I guess just no, we're going to deal with this model. Yes, that's not not all. Yes, because at, 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 some, at some point, uh, if you are if, if, if you expect that you have a good hybrid, uh, then and if you're on ice, no, and you 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 always you always, always be sliding because the model will always tell you that I can should apply a big acceleration. Yes. But the error would be smaller and smaller, right? If you do the iterations, it would be smaller, but you'd still be sliding because the model would always be applying too much power. But then, then you need also your actuation to grow, right? Actuation, then even the time going to zero. So that's where you finish. I think we should stop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cut off the conversation there. Thank you, Toby. Thanks. It's my great, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Christian Kerf. Uh, so Christian is one of the pioneers in brain to speech. There's been a lot of work on brain to speech in the last few years, but uh, we're on true real time speech decoding. A lot of the examples uh, that you might have seen in the literature. Uh, a, a hidden secret there is they're doing these long forward backward passes on the data. So the latencies are on the order of, of seconds, which, uh, you know, when I imagine a, a speech prosthesis, I imagine it as being able to enable uh, the type of interactive speech that we all engage in on a regular basis. And, and if Christian's been really focused on, on, on the real-time aspects uh, of these systems. Um, I think there's some nice tie-ins um, to Lisa's talk earlier today, because um, Christian is building a new plant. And uh, as we bring that plant into reality, there are going to be many sensory motor uh, integration considerations at play. Uh, uh, Dean, who you heard from last week, and Christian uh, collaborate pretty heavily, and Dean made some references to Christian's work. So now we're gonna get the expansion. Thanks, Christian, for being with us uh, here today. Uh, looking forward to the talk. And thank you for the kind introduction. Um, that's great. I'll be talking about decoding speech from invasive EEG today. And uh, please bombard me with questions in between if you feel like it. And if you have remaining questions afterwards, just send me an email or reach out on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Christian, we could just do a quick sound check um, if you want to cheer up. Yeah, we just want to check that you hear us when we ask you a question. Yeah, please do. Okay, good. We will. We'll wait until later. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> Why is this called the invasive EEG instead of ECOG? And because I'm not only using ECOG, but you'll see more of that later. Okay. All right, let's get started. The idea of my group is to build brain computer interfaces. And in a brain computer interface, we want to measure brain activity, apply signal processing, do feature extraction, and then apply some machine learning to steer an application. And uh, I'm sure all of you agree that brain computer interfaces sound fantastic. So the question is, why are we not using them? Even people working in the field of brain computer interfaces don't use them on a daily basis. And the reason for that is that BCIs are super slow and very cumbersome to use. I brought you the most used BCI down here and it is used to spell out messages letter by letter. So let's imagine we want to type out neuromorphic. We focus on the N first. And when the row or column the N is in has flashed often enough, usually four times. You resume the start. We lost you there for just a second, Christian. Oh, am I back? Sorry? Yeah, you're back. We lost you at N. OK, I didn't say anything between. I was uh, doing one of those artistic pauses. 
<laughs> Low bandwidth PCI. <laughs> exactly. So round about now, I think we would have decoded our N and could go on to the next letter. As you see, this is incredibly slow and has typing speeds in the most trained healthy volunteers of about five bits per second. On the other hand, speech is incredibly fast with at least 39 bits per second. Moreover, speech is natural, it's fast, and people actually use speech interfaces, for example, Siri or OK Google on a daily basis. So we had the idea of decoding natural speech from neural data to build the next generation of brain computer interfaces. And for this, we first use electrocorticography. Um, it's an invasive measure of electric brain activity, but I probably don't have to talk much more about it if you heard Dean's talk um, last week. So uh, again, in uh, epilepsy patients, not in healthy volunteers, and it supplies really, really high fidelity neural signals. And the first data set we got uh, for this is a parallel recording of uh, ECOG and microphone. So a person was reading out text shown to them on a screen. And while they read out these texts aloud, uh, we recorded microphone and ECOG simultaneously. We then applied automatic speech recognition to the audio data. And this gives us um, the labeling when each individual phoneme starts and when it stops. So we know the L in Liberty starts here, stops here. The E starts here, stops here, and so forth. As the data is recorded in synchrony, we can then impose these labels from the audio data to the brain data, to the ECOG data, and model these uh, phonemes in the brain data instead. The data we used for this was supplied by uh, Gervin Schalk, who was at the National Center for Adaptive Neurotech and is now um, at a private foundation in China. And he gave us data of seven patients with epilepsy. And while all of them had left hemisphere coverage, as you can see, you can still see the coverage uh, varies widely. Some had no frontal coverage, some had almost only frontal coverage, some had high density coverage, and some just the clinical grids. And what's also important to keep in mind is that we had roughly 10 minutes of data per participant only. To give you a ballpark, the first version of Siri was trained on over 100,000 hours of training data. So don't expect as good results. Now, what we did is we modeled each phoneme through a multivariate um, Gaussian mixture model. So this supplies us with the likelihood for each window of neural activity that this window was emitted by this phone model. So it supplies us with the likelihood this window was uh, emitted by the T model or the R model and so forth. Now, if I always pick the most likely uh, and stick them behind each other, I can already decode speech. But automatic speech recognition is as strong as it is because it combines it with two more knowledge sources. The first one is a dictionary. The dictionary tells us which words can be decoded and what phonemes they're composed of. So for example, today is t a d a. Even if those phone models say the most likely sequence is t day, that's not in the dictionary. So we go to the most next most likely, which is today. And we also add information about language, which sell, tells us we are is a very likely sequence, while I is is a super unlikely sequence. Now, combining these three together and uh, in a Viterbi search, we can get the most likely sequence of words for a new unseen phrase of ECOG data. And here it was, we are committed today because Gervin Schalk decided to have them read out political speeches. And I brought you a video of how well this worked. So the person is reading out aloud sentences shown uh, to them. I changed the voice to make it anonymous. You'll see the high gamma activity on the brain while the person speaks. And then for each phoneme, over time, you see the likelihood that this phoneme is currently spoken. 
Down here, you then see the sequence of phones and of words. To which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today. So if you listen to the voice and read what we decoded, it was doing very well in this example. I want to show you that it didn't only work well for this example, it actually worked for all of our participants better than chance level. In purple, our decoding results versus a chance level in yellow. Quite clearly, the example I picked was from this star subject. Now, the first uh, suspicion we had was that this relies on the accurate decoding of a few phonemes and then everything else falls into place. But looking at the confusion matrix, you see we actually have quite okay decoding of all phonemes. Now, clearly the success depends on the size of the dictionary. So we looked at a dictionary size from 10 to 100 words, how the phoneme, uh, the word error rates develop and they go up from 25% up to almost um, a, a bit over 60%, but they remain better than chance level the entire time. Now, whenever we use complex machine learning, I think it's super important to see what are those uh, models relying on so we can show we're not decoding artifacts. So, we illustrated the mean kullback leibner divergence between those phony models in space and in time. And what you see is the 200 milliseconds before phoneme production, discriminability is largest in inferior frontal cortices, which are known to be involved in speech planning. The closer we get to the production of the phoneme, the higher discriminability gets in the inferior motor cortex, which is responsible for the control of our facial muscles, the tongue, the larynx. And after phoneme production, discriminability is largest in superior temple um, gyrus for audio and speech um, perception. By no means are Sorry. these areas new to the neuroscience of speech production. And Greg Hickok told you all about this uh, over the weekend. But to me, it was very important to see that the machine learning models relied on exactly the areas we would expect them to rely on. Sorry, can I uh, say something? Uh, sure. Can you, so can you go back to these figures? So it's, uh, it's really uh, appalling how these uh, images uh, evoke what you was uh, showing yesterday with the ventral and uh, dorsal stream for speech production and one had that has to do with uh, pitch encoding and the other with uh, formant encoding. Did you, uh, did you see that and uh, do you have anything to say about it? Um, I think, so the problem is that we have continuous speech here. So looking at these aspects isolated is a bit difficult because you always have the core articulation aspect. Uh, I, I I think there's better data sets to, um, to look at um, for speech neuroscience than this one. No, I didn't look at it uh, in detail. Christian, okay. um, yeah, also, I mean, you're limited in terms of coverage. That's an important thing to remember as well. Um, is this an aggregate of all of the subjects or is this a single subject? And great that you point this out. I, I should have said that this is the aggregate of all subjects. Okay, but yeah, across the subjects, I would expect that you wouldn't have complete coverage of both the ventral and the stream. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, within one subject, uh, rarely, you're right. Thanks. Okay, um, what made me very happy about this work is that it has been replicated several times. And most excitingly, it has been brought to those in need. First, um, by the Chang lab, David Moses was in the lead um, uh, last year, I think, no, 2021. Um, 
And very recently, so far only in a preprint, using uh, Utah arrays um, by Jamie Henderson's group, uh, uh, Frank Willett was in the lead here. So uh, instead of uh, healthy volunteers, like we used in our study, these showed that this translation to text worked in patients suffering from ALS. So uh, I, I think this is really good to see. But Excuse a textual me. representation of speech doesn't hey, have. This is yeah, I'm a bit confused. Uh, aren't all these subjects you were decoding while they were speaking? Yes. So but the results I just showed you. ALS couldn't speak. So how would you do that with your? Yeah. So she having uh, Christian was pointing to more recent work than his own. Right. In that more recent work, yeah. uh, there are individuals with, an, with anarthria yeah. um, so that were able to drive. The but those were listening to speech and they were decoded. I mean, how did they? No, they, they these were attempted production in speech motor cortex. Attempted production. That's how the yes. model was. Right? Can you get enough signal? Yes. They, they were, the, that one was trained on was some kind of DNA that was trained on. They were trying to. Uh, they were given a, a something, uh, a pointer, and asked to articulate it. Cor correct. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Christian, yeah, I don't want to take words from, from you on this presentation, but I'm acting as translator here. Uh, so, like in these studies, they, they, the individuals were cued to, uh, to during uh, a calibration to portion. And during that calibration portion, there's an agreement subject and the experimenter on what they're attempting. And uh, from that data, you can build a machine learning model. Now you can go into inference and in real time, pseudo real time, we can go more into those details. How the heck do they get enough data to train this? Because those, like effectively imagine they can so they the amount. Yeah, it's a, that, that's a very long answer. That in some cases they're they're using a very um, small language model. So, like in the first in that top paper with ECOG, it's it's only fifty words. Okay. With the micro electrode arrays, they're actually it's a corpus of one hundred twenty five thousand words. They're decoding at the phoneme level, uh, and so it's a very small phoneme set. Uh, and then they're able to use the language model to construct. Uh, so full they just the phonemes. Correct. For, yeah, for the for the second study. And only for that subject, because you can't generalize the community. Yeah, it's subject specific. So that is another problem with using ECOG is that you really have to redo it for every subject, right? Absolutely. All of these models so far are person specific. You're right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, but a textual representation is not all that's there in, in speech. And we all know how annoying a, a chat window can be. You react to the wrong answer and then you always have a delay. Because natural conversation is fast, it's immediate, it's not constrained to a limited amount of words or classes. And natural speech is so much more than just the words. We have prosody, we have accentuation. I can go up with my voice at the end of a phrase to indicate a question. So we had the target of directly synthesizing speech from these neural data instead. And for this, we first teamed up with Mark Slutsky, who had six participants undergoing glioma removal. So in this case, it's not epilepsy patients, it's patients undergoing surgery for brain tumor. And there you have to map what is still tumor tissue and what, better, what should better stay in. He used high fidelity eight by eight electrode uh, grids with a uh, very uh, tight spacing, only four millimeters between those uh, electrodes. And they were placed on premotor, motor and inferior frontal cortices, particularly for speech um, uh, pro production. Here, participants read out only single words shown on, on the screen. And you see the placement of the electrodes in this study. And even though it was targeted the same every time, you still see uh, it's widely different between participants. So 
Um, here we have quite a few inferior frontal electrodes. Here we just have a couple. Here it is tilted. So transferability is always extremely hard to impossible. And what we first tried to synthesize speech from these neural data is from the high gamma features, use a neural network that predicts spectrogram. So for each window of neural data, predict a window of a spectral representation of speech. And then from this spectral representation, we use the vocoder that reproduce an audio waveform. Now, this technique worked and we got better than chance reconstruction of the audio. But what worked better is a technique from the uh, speech synthesis community from the early 90s. This approach is called unit selection. And how it works is you go through your test data, so the sentence you want to synth or the word you want to synthesize. And for each window of neural activity, you go through your training data and compare them to it. Oh, sorry. So for this purple bit, you go through all the training data and see, aha, this is most similar. For the similarity, we use the cosine similarity. And in the training data, you have the corresponding audio. And then you just cut out the corresponding audio. For the yellow bit, you then go through and find the next uh, most similar bit and stick it to the purple bit. Then for the green bit, you do the same, cut it out and stick it together with relatively simple signal processing. And I brought you some examples of how well this worked. You will hear uh, seven words first, how the patient spoke them, and then how we reconstructed them from neural data alone. Page. 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 Persian. Persian. Watch. Watch. Shook. Shook. Steer. Steer. Vision. Vision. So this incredibly simple method has the added benefit of using the user's own voice because you're essentially just putting bits of the user's original voice together. And we did achieve above chance level decoding from all three areas, inferior frontal, premotor and motor areas, but clearly the motor um, M1 provides most of the decoding information. In fact, there was no significant difference between uh, only motor cortex and all electrodes. We were so happy with those results that we conducted a listening test in which we asked 55 participants to listen to those words and tell from a list of four words, all of the same length, which one they heard. And indeed, with an a mean accuracy of 66%, they could identify the right word. So while clearly not perfect, it showed that it is possible to synthesize speech from those neural recordings. But this technique is still very invasive. As you can see here, ECOG, a craniotomy is necessary. So uh, for long-term implants, it might not be the ideal solution. And the even bigger problem, most of the studies so far are based on actual speech. So from persons that can articulate normally. Now, for a brain-computer interface, that's not very helpful because if I can speak normally, I might just use Siri instead of going through all the shenanigans of getting something implanted. So we set out to solve these two issues next. And our first idea was to use stereotactic EEG instead of ECOG. In stereotactic EEG, long shafts of electrodes are implanted into the brain. And for this, no craniotomy is necessary. Just a tiny hole is uh, drilled into the skull to allow the, those shafts being implanted. Neurosurgeons call this a minimally invasive procedure and it has indeed a much lower risk pro profile. What's but, also cool- Can I ask a question? 
when the yeah. surgeons when the surgeons insert this but doesn't have a big chance of uh, of causing a, a blood a clot blood loss from puncturing veins in the brain veins and arteries in the brain you are absolutely right if you would just stick these in you would definitely get problems but uh, the neurosurgeons target these shafts beforehand to uh, not go to any of the larger blood vessels and the smaller blood vessels are pushed out of the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, this has a, indeed a very, very uh, uh, low complication rate. In fact, 10 years ago, electrocorticography, ECOG, was still the standard in the States. And by now, there's almost no center still doing uh, ECOG. Stereo EG has almost completely taken over. Yeah, and, and this is well documented. I, I think the complication rate is, is about a tenth that of surface ECOG. Oh, wow. yeah. uh, no, but okay. you can do it. But, but you drill all the scum and then you go over the dura or into the into the dura. They, 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 they need to the Yeah. It's going all the way through. Into the dura, right down into, yeah, into, into, into the brain. brain. Into the brain. So you're making so a, a little incision in the dura, and then you're so pushing it through. Right there, it's caught, but not superficial no, electrodes and all that. The micro electrodes going all the way down. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call them micro electrodes. They're, I don't know. That, that, we, we can yeah. debate that, right, in terms of electrode size. But most of these electrodes are still on the order of a millimeter, right, in size. Yeah, they're even two millimeters. These really are not micros. They also measure uh, local field potentials. Um, yeah, they're not micro. They're, they're quite large and they go really deep. The longest of these shafts uh, cross from one hemisphere to the other. So yeah, this is long. Yeah, but it's fairly routine neurosurgery nowadays. Absolutely. What sites do they have? How many electrode sites do you have? Um, so the ones we use have between five and 18 contact points. So in this illustration, you see all of these dots are a, a measurement location. Um, and in terms of shaft lengths, I, I don't know how long. I mean, they're easily this long. And for, for an individual subject, you can have up to a couple hundred electrodes yeah. total implanted. <laughs> yeah, we usually do 128 uh, contact points, so that's 18 shafts. And it doesn't cause brain damage to put those in. Well, these have surgery. No, Sorry, I, I didn't catch that. So the question was whether this causes uh, brain damage. So to me, this was also surprising. I thought sticking something into the brain was more harmful than placing the grid on top of it. But no, usually this doesn't cause any lasting brain damage. Yeah, so part of the assessment is functional deficits. And again, within these groups, comparing ECOG and SEEG, there is no significant difference with respect to functional deficits. Is the brain a needle around? Uh, I Question was whether the brain anneals around the probe. So there's some pushing out of the way, right? Yeah, I, I think mostly that's it. Um, I think we don't entirely know whether it's healing or is it just pushing uh, out of the way or is it if it's just redundancy in the architecture that whatever is pierced wasn't so important in the first place. What, what I think is another great advantage of these is that they are very similar to the shafts used in deep brain stimulation. And as you know, these can stay in for decades. So I, I think they have good long-term potential also. So we set out to see, can we do speech BCI with these shafts as well? And our first study was um, patients reading out sentences from the Mozilla Common Voice Corpus. Um, my group is located in the Netherlands, so patients were reading out Dutch sentences. And in this study, we have 10 to 20 minutes of data, depending on the speed they were reading. Uh, and the first study looked at three patients. By now, we've recorded 54. So um, we have really good inclusions going. And 
um, I had a, a visiting PhD student from ETH Zurich, and he, of course, wanted to build a neural network because students always want to build neural network models. And we tried a sequence to sequence model from stereo EG features. We used high gamma again to spectrogram. So that means we use the data from an entire sentence to map to the spectrogram of an entire sentence. Quite clearly, as Vakash has indicated before, this wouldn't work in a closed loop setup. So what we're looking at is how good can we possibly get? And the network he built was inspired by Tacotron 2. Tacotron 2 is a Google's text to speech model. So when you type something into Google Translate and then listen to what it sounds like, that's done by Tacotron 2. So uh, it has an attention mechanism between an encoder and a decoder. So an encoder of the brain data to a decoder to the spectral representation. And from the spectral representation to the audio, we used a, a pre-trained wave glow network again. And indeed, we got very nice results. I'm going to play you an example again. Um, this is the prompt the patient saw, and you're hearing the original first and then the reconstruction. Het resultaat ligt op de originatiebalk. Verder. Now, what you hear that the, the quality is okay, quite clearly not perfect, but okay. But importantly, what you also heard is that the patient didn't read the sentence they're supposed to read out. And this is an important point I want to get to later. Now, as we use an attention mechanism, and as I said to me, it's always important to understand what those networks are, are doing. We looked at what part of the output sequence was attending to which part of the input sequence. And as you can see for all three patients, early parts of the output sequence attend to early parts of the input sequence. So you have this nice diagonal. But what you also see that the wide padding we used, we used longer neural sequences than audio sequences, was not necessary. So this early part and this late part don't seem to be very um, important in the attention mechanism. And indeed, we ran an ablation study and leaving these beginnings and endings out, we got almost the same results. We compared the output to a dense neural network, uh, actually the one uh, I showed you earlier, and the sequence to sequence model outperformed it for all three patients. We were also interested in um, if the model had already saturated or if we would still benefit from more training data. And you can see with more training data, results still improve. So it looks like uh, those 10 to 20 minutes are not sufficient. Hey, Christian, we have a question, yeah. Toby. But uh, is it, it's not a fair comparison unless you keep the number of parameters the same, right? But is it, the point is that this architecture is very important. It's attention architecture important, but to compare them, you have to also utilize the number of parameters at least, right? Uh, you're absolutely, absolutely right. To have the perfect uh, comparison that would be better, we didn't do that, but you're right. Uh, I acknowledge that, yes. Good. Now, uh, I hinted at this before. Um, the second big issue we wanted to solve was to get to imagined speech. And I, I mentioned we record a lot of data, but if you tell patients, please imagine to speak out this word or please imagine to read out the sentence, all of the patients tell us, I don't know, know how to do this. Um, I can't imagine to speak. So we tried to record data nevertheless, and we found absolutely nothing. We didn't find any uh, reliable decoding from those phrases when they were supposed to imagine to speak. And what is important that these are healthy volunteers. Um, they can speak and there is no benefit for them to imagine to speak. So 
Uh, I think they just don't do it because it's no fun. And I mean, why would you? So uh, Miguel Angrik, who's now at Johns Hopkins and who posted a super exciting speech decoding preprint just yesterday. And I came to the idea that we can do imagined speech only if we provide immediate feedback. So as soon as I start thinking about speak, I, I hear something reconstructed from the computer. So for this pilot study, we use data from one uh, female, again, Dutch speaking participant, and we trained the model on 100 audible words. Again, we need a bit of aud uh, uh, audible training data and then tested it in closed loop while she whispered. So moving her muscles as if speaking, but not producing audio. And then when she imagined. And I brought you a video of how this worked. So our estimated delay is around 30 milliseconds. So as soon as she starts to uh, whisper or to imagine to speak, she will hear the feedback uh, by the closed loop pipeline. First, you hear what the pipeline does from normal speech and then the two closed loop variants. <clears throat> Up here, you see the high gamma activity recorded with SEG while she uh, speaks, whispers, and imagines. Now, close loop while she whispers. And now, finally, while she imagines to speak. Now, I could do the easy way and tell you, you don't understand this because it's Dutch, but clearly it's also not understandable for Dutch speakers. The idea here was to provide a fast and immediate feedback. We didn't pay attention to the best possible quality. We're currently working on getting the quality better for this. <clears throat> Looking at the results, you see some examples of the reconstructed waveforms here. And we aligned using a dynamic time warping um, the produced audio uh, to previous recorded words. And it was, we had higher correlations um, with the word than with other words for both whisper, whisper and imagine. And we decoded a lot more speech during the trials than outside of the trials. So it did indeed seem that we can reconstruct speech uh, in real time from imagined speech using uh, stereo EEG. As usual, I wanted to see where the decoding came from. So we looked at the weights of the linear decoding model. And what you see is we have uh, large weights for the decoding in the orange shaft, 200 milliseconds before speaking, and that's here in the inferior frontal cortex again. We have high model weights <clears throat> um, in the pink shaft in uh, supplementary motor areas, in the olive shaft, that's this one here in uh, inferior motor cortex. So while SEG is a lot harder to interpret than um, ECOG, it still looks like we're sampling from some regions that make sense. And with that, I would like to conclude and uh, brainstorm with you and answer your questions. Um, my conclusions are that I think speech can be decoded from intracranial recordings. Speech can also be synthesized in real time from in minimally invasive recordings. I think oftentimes simple models are as good as more complex ones when little training data is available. And to me, it's super important to understand what those models are doing to foster scientific insights. All of this was a huge team effort. I thank uh, all of the people involved, the PhD students, uh, Peter Kuben, the neurosurgeon who actually drilled those holes, 
and of course, uh, my funders. Thank you. Yes, I have a first question. It's, um, I guess, a bit more general, but I'm uh, trying to understand. So these uh, BCIs, uh, minimally invasive BCIs, as you say, um, can help people who have, um, I can see that the benefit of that for some clinical population, but is it something that can be, could be installed in people for a long-term use, for instance? How would that work? So, Quickly, currently, no, because all of these electrode shafts have FDA approval for only 29 days. Um, I mean, quite clearly, biocompatibility and so on have been shown. I think it would be possible to get them registered for long-term use, but so far, they're not allowed to be implanted for long-term. And uh, do you see any way to then bridge this gap that would uh, really uh, make the, the use of these for clinical population on the long term? How, what are the paths there? So my personal opinion is that this is a fantastic research opportunity because the patients are implanted anyway. So we can test what works, how you can train, how do you, how do you design this real-time pipeline? But if you want to implant for long term, I think there are better measurement technologies out there. For example, the UTA array um, or um, the neuropixels. So if you really want to help a patient, I don't think you should implant stereo EEG. But what I think until we implant, these are a fantastic uh, research opportunity. Um, so Christian, Thanks for that lovely talk, really, really clear and understandable. Really, Thank really you. Yeah. Um, so when they had this patient that could uh, create audio with their brain signals, did the patient have this a young Dutch woman, did she have the opportunity to just play with it? In other words, was she able to uh, just play with it and try to create sounds on her own? Could she learn to create sounds? Uh, to me, this is a, a fantastic um, question because I believe a BCI is not shipped as is and then you use it. I think we need co-adaptation. So the algorithm gets better and better, but more importantly, the user learns how to operate it. Um, and yes, this woman played around with it uh, for a bit before we did this recording uh, of which I showed you the results. But I think what is really necessary is a long-term training regime, allowing them to get better and better. And uh, we, we're currently trying to look at that, but don't have any concrete results yet. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so you use uh, Pacotron and these other like uh, sort of encoder-decoder methods, which are you know awesome for synthesis. Um, and now in Vogue are like audio diffusers. And one of the advantages there is that, so my observation of, of seeing the synthesized waveforms is that you were doing very good jobs at the envelope detection and the envelope decoding, um, which is all you get if you're using an encoder decoder. But if you're using something like a diffuser, which is essentially, it's gonna treat that as this is a noise envelope. I'm trying to get to somewhere more speechy uh, from a machine learning perspective. So you hallucinate your way to the end, which can be conditioned on the speaker's voice and all those things. So if you're interested in, um, I wanna make the best speech decoder for someone who's trying to speak with just brain waves versus I'm trying to decode something more fundamental about how the brain operates. Uh, I guess that's a long comment to ask, are you going to try to fuse it? <laughs> I think you're 100% right. Diffuses will oh, no. work will better. Um, I would love to try it. I'm a bit lacking the manpower in my group to try this at the moment. I would love to try it. Send me an email, you get the data, we try it together. Well, I guess one of the questions is, is one of the reasons this question that Tim asked is because you're using the gamma activity and that may not have more information than just sort of modulated by the envelope. 
I don't know to what extent it has to do with the brain data versus the choice of model. Um, I think it's a it's a good point. Um, and in some patients, we might really only have uh, the information about the envelope. In other patients, it's clearly enough to discriminate within speech as well. Um, one of our problems is it's hard to to predict beforehand based on the on the coverage which one you will get. Um, but you're right. I think in many patients we only have information about the envelope. Maybe maybe if I can ask a follow up there, because you you I have my own bias, which is towards uh, intracortical Utah rays, neuropixel type solutions. But um, do you do you think there's a big difference between uh, what one can do with respect to uh, specific utterances when you move from uh, local field potential based strategies to single unit? I have not worked with the single unit data so far, but from what I see with the current Willett paper, I am confident that you get a, so much better fidelity with uter rays um, that, yeah, for an actual application, this is where you want to go, I believe. Um, so uh, going back again to this lovely idea to give this audio feedback to this uh, woman, did you know that that was successful? I mean, in what way, you know, obviously you get some uh, feedback signal that you're, it's working or not, right? But did you could you show that it really was effective over this very short time that you had to do the experiment? Like, how do you know that that was effective versus not giving it? Like, did you try not turning on the speaker or giving the feedback? Or somehow, was it important to get the data to have this feedback? We did not try that with this participant. But from the past, when we did all the recordings where we just asked people to now imagine, it, it didn't work. So but and in this patient, it worked. But no, for this one, we didn't try that. Dot. That's a good point. But even if you give them the little bouncing dot, like interpretability of models helps to foster, you know, they can follow this bouncing dot along. And that'll tell, that'll tell the algorithm where they think the imagined speech should be when they're reading back text. Did you try uh, that? Um, no, but I think uh, this is exactly the time of um, training regimes we need to implement in the future to get to better results. Yes. But again, time with the patients is... Um, is limited. So especially if you ask them to read out stuff and then ask them to read out stuff in uh, specific rhythms, um, it's not exciting to the patients. So they get a bit bored. So uh, usually after two hours, yeah, that's the most we can get from them per day. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um... The, the sound is not too convincing, but it's very promising. Um, and I'm wondering if you considered using large language models to uh, come up with better predictions, uh, filling in some of the blanks that are clearly right there in the um, ECOG data. Um, you're absolutely right. So instead of using that simple language model I had in the first study, if you use large language models, you will be a lot better. But when you use large language models, you always have the delay because then you're operating on the word level. So you at least have the delay of a word and then you don't have this immediacy thing anymore. Um, I, I personally consider a brain to text solved after the, uh, the Willard paper uh, that came or that will come out very soon. Um, so uh, yes, it will get better, but then you lose the immediate uh, reconstruction. Uh, so it's it's a tight line you have to walk between the two. Do you want to have the best possible results or do you want to enable the most natural speech? Thank yeah. you. So 
just a quick follow up on that question, which is, I mean, I, I could see this field going in both of those directions simultaneously, but exactly. one consideration that we as a field haven't really thought through yet uh, that deeply and it's kind of fun here at the workshop um, was that one, if we go for low latency, we may be engaging kind of natural internal models uh, that are important for speech, but we are providing a plant that uh, a, a synthesis system interaction and uh, versus if we were to introduce longer delays so that we're purposefully uh, disengaging that internal model, right? Like there, in one case, we're at the, the low latency of natural speech, but uh, also we have these internal models to deal with. On the other side, we're purposefully delaying to avoid those internal models. And we also have the benefit of having a little bit more uh, a causal data. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, exactly that will happen, that the user has the two modes to choose from, right? The immediate model that works uh, less good uh, and that might to need might need to be filtered a bit. And um, then on the other hand, the, the model aided by a large language model that works a lot better, but has a delay. I agree. That's a question. I mean, how robust are the signals in natural settings? You know, because you know, as a human, you're always thinking of multiple different things, even though you might be producing speech. How robust would it be in natural conditions where there's external That's signals? Yeah, yeah. This is like the total power that we are into this problem. In fact, I um, mean, I mean, do you have to focus intensely to get the best results? As the user, like not think of anything else, but <laughs> for the experiment, but not for a real person speaking. We don't sit down there thinking, imagine different versions of this. No, no, I mean, you think of other things like, oh, I have to turn on the oven and you know, all these people speak, right? That's why right. you have to turn it on. It was very yeah. controlled, yeah. Here, right? Very I have a question. No, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Christian, were you able to get the question? No, not really. I'm sorry. So uh, let me try to re-paraphrase and correct me if I'm wrong. So um, how context dependent are these results uh, where here you have a very controlled experimental context? Uh, what do you think would happen in a more naturalistic setting like this setting over, <laughs> which is pretty complicated in terms of communication? <laughs> or uh, yeah, if, if there's distractions or if the person is uh, thinking about what to say while they're speaking, they're not just cued. I, um, I, I think that's a great point and very likely our current models would totally break down if the patient wasn't so focused, if there was uh, other auditory input, just like the first um, speech models from audio data broke down in cocktail party situations, I think the very same would happen to these first neural models as well. So do I get a sense from you that because you propose using uh, the uh, neuropixel electrodes and the Utah arrays and all that, that MEG and EEG are pretty hopeless for now? So Given there are some really nice Dutch data sets in MEG. Um, both MEG and EEG are great. I think why... Uh, um, the speech decoding has focused so much on the invasive data is that in, in imagined speech, it's so hard to label where does the person start, where do they stop, and how fast are they in between. So in actual speech production, you don't have that problem. But if you have actual speech production in MEG or EEG, all you're measuring is EMG. So... This is why uh, I think the field has focused so much on invasive measures because we don't have those um, movement artifacts in the data. I, I think particularly MEG is actually quite promising to get there too.
Are you familiar with the decoding of listened speech from MEG responses going on now? Um, I I saw the recent study by Jean Remy King, yeah. um, also using large language models. Um, very impressive work. Actually, I visited them in the Meta France headquarter two weeks ago um, uh -huh. to talk about this. I, super exciting work. Great. Uh, we got to move on to the next talk, but Christian, thank you so much. This was really fun. And thank you so much for having me. This was really good discussion. Thank you. Nice talk. Okay. Okay. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dimitri. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dimitri Patel. He's from MIT. I have Watson Lab. Uh, Dimitri, you know, got his PhD from Princeton. Then he did a stint at, uh, at uh, Princeton. No, what's it? Advanced. Uh, I forgot. It should be advanced. advanced. Yeah, advanced. 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 And then uh, since then, he has been at uh, IBM, mighty IBM. I got to know about Dimitri's work. Uh, you know about the can fruit fly brain do NLP? He has this very nice paper. Right? He didn't. Have the brain to NLP. Yeah. And uh, you know, he didn't want to talk about it, but he wants to talk about associated memory. So I would let him take the stage and explain like why is that more important than talking about fruit fly brain? Okay. Okay. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Can fruit fly both uh, have fruit fly photoreceptor and two macro chain on the castle? <laughs> There's a very technical question here. Can fruit fly brain do Markov chain Monte Carlo. That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> I mean, for, for that, you need some notion of the energy function, right? And yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. Good question. I don't know. Yeah, they yeah. might. They might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Dimitri, just ignore him. So just go ahead. Go. Yeah. go ahead. Please. Okay. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, uh, for uh, for the introduction. Indeed, I, I I sort of I work on all kinds of um, ideas that are in between neuroscience, machine learning, uh, sometimes physics, and indeed, like I'm I'm happy that uh, you guys have heard about this paper on fruit flies, uh, in which we sort of you know took some uh, neurobiological network motif from the fruit fly olfactory system. And we used it for some other task that is kind of more interesting from the machine learning perspective. And I like that line of work a lot, but but somehow like there is another line of work that I like even more. And and um, I was sort of planning to tell you about uh, this other line of work that is about uh, some recent uh, developments in the field of Hopfield networks. In uh, Hopfield networks, as I'm sure many of you have heard uh, and know, uh, perhaps better than I uh, are somewhat neurobiologically inspired and uh, and there has been some ideas uh, uh, like uh, floating around about maybe even build some hardware devices that are implementing those networks so so i realized that the audience at this uh, workshop is extremely diverse and uh, you guys come from all kinds of backgrounds uh, ranging from algorithms hardware machine learning neuroscience etc and uh, Hopefully, as you will see, the ideas that I'm planning to talk about uh, are also very diverse, and uh, they come from, again, neuroscience, statistical physics, uh, machine learning, and sort of because of uh, these two kinds of diversity, both in terms of ideas and in terms of uh, attendees, uh, what I'm planning to do is to start with a very high-level uh, introduction and sort of try to explain some intuitive ideas behind uh, the concepts that I'm planning to use, and then I'm going to move uh, towards more uh, mathematically well-defined uh, uh, definitions of those um, ideas and try to explain how they can use uh, how, how they can be used for building some interesting machine learning systems. So that's roughly speaking my plan for today. And I would love uh, for you guys to interact uh, to interrupt me with questions. So please uh, don't be shy and don't wait until the very end. It's much more fun if we have a conversation. So. Uh, so let me 
Did you work at IDA? Excuse me? Did you work at IDA? IDA Yeah, did you work at IDA there? At Princeton? Yes. Each one of the houses. Uh, so, so at Princeton, I was a grad student in the physics department, and uh, after that, I went to uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, and uh, all both these organizations have absolutely nothing to do with IBM, and only after that, I moved to IBM. But I sort of started working on these ideas of uh, dense associative memories that I'm going to explain uh, why I was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, start with the definition. So what is this uh, Hopfield network of associative memory and why are uh, many people excited about it? So essentially uh, a Hopfield network is a, a kind of recurrent neural network. Uh, and what this means is that uh, you have a state vector uh, and the state vector is allowed to evolve in time according to some nonlinear differential equation or some nonlinear discrete update rule. And uh, what is cool about Hopfield networks, as opposed to many other RNNs that we uh, like to work with, like LSTM or uh, gated recurrent units, is that Hopfield networks have something that is called an energy function. And like, uh, you know, uh, some of you wanted to do a Markov chain Monte Carlo, right? So like, like uh, you can certainly do Markov chain Monte Carlo in this kind of models that I'm about to describe. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, uh, it might connect to uh, your previous question. So, so uh, essentially in this slide, you can see a, a cartoon diagram that sort of uh, summarizes the basic idea behind Hopfield network. So uh, on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, you can see the energy function. And on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, you can see some coordinate through the state, state space of this network. And typically in a practical application, the state space is extremely high dimensional. So it's not just one dimensional space, but for the purposes of this cartoon illustration, I'm gonna assume that it's a one dimensional space. And essentially, if you uh, think about the typical energy landscape of a Hopfield network of associative memory, it looks roughly speaking like this. So it has some high energy states somewhere and it has a bunch of local minima. By the way, when I see when I move my mouse, do you see where what I'm pointing at? Or yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So it has a bunch of local minima. In the terminology here is the following: uh, the local minima of this energy function are called memories, and typically these memories are very high dimensional vectors. So they live in some uh, kind of you know n dimensional vector space. And each uh, of these local minima corresponds to some semantically different pattern. So for example, uh, I could imagine that you guys uh, gave me a bunch of high resolution images. And I would like to design a network uh, so that I, I'm gonna place one image that you have given to me in one local minimum. So essentially I'm gonna uh, try to design the energy landscape so that each local minimum uh, corresponds to one uh, image from the uh, data set that you uh, gave to me. And if I do that, I can solve a couple of uh, simple tasks. For example, I can uh, start, I can present to my network an initial state that looks like this. So you kind of can see that uh, there is a bit of a hint of what uh, an image should look like. There is a beak of some bird, but three quarters of the image are not presented to the network at the moment of time t equals to zero. So I can take this initial state, I can put it somewhere high up on the energy landscape, and then I can let this state which is uh, denoted here by this red ball to roll down the hill along the energy landscape until it reaches one of the local uh, minima. And once it does reach a local minimum, we can say that uh, dynamics has stopped, right? Because uh, the ball is only allowed to uh, roll downhill. So it never is allowed to go up the hill. Uh, so then once it uh, reaches a local minimum, it cannot move any longer. And we can take the state uh, that corresponds to that local minimum and we can put it back in the image plane. And essentially I'm gonna uh, play this movie for you. And you can see uh, that as dynamics progresses, as the red ball rolls down the hill along the energy landscape, this simple network can reconstruct a nice image of the broad, right? So it can kind of, you know, take the prompt, which is uh, a hint of what the image should look like. And it can go to one of the local minima. Now I'm uh, going to take. I have a question. Yes, please. I have a question. 
Is this a conservative system or a non-conservative system? It is not conservative in the following sense. It dissipates energy, right? So it's a little bit yeah. like, uh, if you think about uh, physics, it's a little bit no, like- you won't get to the That was the reason I asked. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so the energy you. goes down, yeah. Okay, so now let's take exactly the same network with exactly the same set of uh, synaptic weights and give it a slightly different input. Uh, so here I have taken one of the memories, a different memory, and I have added a large amount of Gaussian white noise to it. So that if you look at this initial state, by and large, you can't really tell what is plotted in that image. Yet, if I give it to the same network, you can see that uh, the same dynamics down the hill, the energy landscape leads us uh, to a different local minimum that now corresponds to the image of uh, the ball. And uh, these two uh, use cases, they sort of illustrate the typical examples of how uh, associative memories can be used. They typically used either for pattern completion, which was shown on the left, or denoise that was shown on the right. And I also like to uh, take this little animation and stop it somewhere in the middle. And depending on the quality of your screen, hopefully you might be able to see uh, the shadow of the same broad in the background. Mm. Yeah. What this uh, illustrates is that the dynamics and the computation that this network is doing is an extremely collective phenomenon. So it's not just the network picks the closest memory and just goes straight to it. It's not just a simple lookup table. It's a little bit more sophisticated and it relies on the dynamical trajectory in the state space. And it also involves a collective interactions between many neurons and many memories, right? But, so, but, mm -hmm. so but in these dense associated memories, is very poor, something like 0.16 number of programs. So how are we gonna store in a finite in a in a finite network end, how are you gonna store efficiently your data? Yeah. Yes, and, and that's essentially what, uh, you know, a, a substantial fraction of my uh, talk will be about. How can we store those memories? How can we do it efficiently? What does it mean to store them efficiently? And, uh, you know, how can we uh, build some mathematical theory uh, to tell us, you know, how much, how many memories can we store? So, so that's what I'm going to talk about on the next slides. Okay, so just uh, give me, give me like a minute. I'll get to that. Uh, so let's talk about this. So indeed, uh, this simple idea that I have just described uh, have been famously formalized by John Hopfield in the 80s. And uh, what he proposed is uh, the following uh, construction. So imagine that we uh, write the energy function for a simple associative memory network as a, a bilinear form. So essentially, in this formula, the vector sigma i is an n-dimensional vector. And uh, in order to construct the energy, we essentially take that vector, we multiply it by symmetric matrix Tij, and then we multiply it by the same vector transposed. And that's a quadratic form is the energy. For simplicity, let's assume that this vector is a binary vector. So essentially, each sigma i is equal to plus or minus one. For those of you who come from the physics background, it immediately reminds you about the Ising model, right? The famous Ising model, where uh, you do these kinds of, you know, uh, binary variables. Uh, but biologically, you can think about sigma i as uh, as uh, activity of neurons. So essentially, if sigma i is equal to minus one, then the neuron is silent, and if sigma i is equal to plus one, the neuron fires an action potential. So let's think about this uh, from these two perspectives. Now, it turns out that if you take uh, the memory vectors uh, in literally in the form that I have defined on the previous slide, so uh, size uh, with the upper index wheel, which correspond to different kinds of memories. And there is also each of those xi is a vector. Uh, and the vector uh, encodes how uh, these memories are encoded in the pixel space in the simplest uh, cartoon illustration of uh, images, right? So if we take those size, what we can do is the following. We can uh, pretend that neurons uh, are related to each pixel in this image. So they're denoted by this index i. And now we have a lot of different memories, a lot of different pictures that we would like to remember that are now enumerated by the index mu. 
So what we can do is the following. We can take the outer product of these memory vectors psi mu i with themselves and con construct this symmetric matrix Tij and plug it into this expression for the energy function. And as Hopfield and many others realized in the 80s, if you do just that, uh, the model that is shown on the left portion of the slide will describe a very nice model of associative memory with all those uh, properties that I have introduced on the first slide. But only if the number of memories, the number of uh, these indices mu or the number of different images that we want to remember is sufficiently small. So specifically, it can be shown that if uh, the images are random, and the reason why we like to work with random images is because uh, it's easy to do some mathematics. It's easy to quantify things and we can uh, like write some analytical formulas. But it turns out that uh, if you derive uh, certain relationships for random uh, images or random memories, you can often extrapolate them to more sort of interesting real looking images coming from real data sets. But if we're talking about random images, what uh, is true is the following, that the maximal number of memories that you can store and retrieve from this simple uh, classical Hopfield network scales linearly with the uh, number of neurons. So essentially, uh, uh, n here is the total number of pixels or neurons. 0.14 is some numerical coefficient that comes out of some uh, sophisticated mathematics. And Kmax is the largest amount of number of local minima that you can uh, put into the system and you can uh, get uh, the states corresponding to those local minima back from the dynamics. And as you can see, it grows linearly with the uh, size of the network or with the number of neurons. And it turns out that this linear scaling relationship is extremely annoying uh, from the perspective of practical machine learning applications. And there are many reasons why, but let me just give you a uh, kind of, you know, one example of why this is annoying. Imagine that you are trying to store black and white images. And let's say that we are gonna put them on a 28 by 28 grid. So something like an MNIST image. But let's imagine that instead of MNIST images, we're gonna write uh, Japanese kanji characters in, the, in, in that grid 28 by 28, right? So uh, what this scaling relationship, if we literally apply it to that problem would tell us is that given 784 neurons, which is 28 by 28 grid, the maximal number of memories or distinct uh, patterns that we were able to store in this network is uh, equal to roughly speaking 110. And that's just clearly not enough to describe all uh, Japanese kanji characters, right? We can easily uh, give, uh, you know, uh, build some simple AI like fit forward neural network uh, that would recognize all those kanji characters. An educated Japanese person needs to know, roughly speaking, 2,000 kanji characters to read the newspaper, right? So there's clearly a, like a bit of a problem, uh, a bit of a discrepancy between the statistical behavior of this conventional classical Hopfield network and uh, the behavior of both biological systems, uh, by that I mean like an educated Japanese person, or a, you know, desirable AI system that would be able to meaningfully work with those kanji characters. So something clearly is missing. And uh, a few years ago, we started thinking about this problem and we realized that it is very easy to actually dramatically surpass this annoying linear scaling relationship in these networks by simply allowing non-quadratic terms in this energy function. So as you can see, uh, the most sort of striking thing about this energy function is that it is quadratic in sigmas. But what if you allow more nonlinear functions? And that's essentially uh, the main uh, idea behind dense associative memories. So uh, let me uh, go back for a second to the classical Hopfield network uh, uh, so that we could better understand the formula on the right. So let's again take a look at these two formulas. And if I take this expression for the matrix Tij and I plug it into the expression for the energy, you can easily see that I can rearrange the sums over indices i, j, and mu in the, a way so that I can rewrite this energy function in the following form. So essentially, I take the dot product between the state vector sigma in each individual memory, and then I square uh, that overlap for each individual memory, and then I sum it up with respect to all the memories, and that's my energy. 
right? So that's the old classical hot field network. Now, the only difference between that uh, network and uh, the modern hot field network or dense associative network is that that overlap needs to be passed through a, mere, a very rapidly uh, and very aggressively growing activation function F. So for example, we can uh, pick uh, the function F as a power function, like X to the power N. And uh, when uh, the parameter little n is equal to two, then we recover the old classical Hopfield network, right? Because it's quadratic. Uh, but if n is bigger than two, for example, equal to three or four, you can clearly see that this energy function becomes a more nonlinear function of sigma. So it's no longer quadratic form. In sigmas, it's, uh, it has cubic terms, quartic terms, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that if you solve exactly the same problem, if you take, uh, uh, if you ask the following question, how many random memories can I store and retrieve in this network? It turns out that the capacity now scales a much uh, more favorable way. So for example, uh, for the power law, you can show that the largest number of memories that you can store scales like size of the network raised to the power n minus one. So when little n is equal to two, then you recover the familiar linear scaling relationship. But if n is bigger than two, then you can get much, much, much better than that, right? So it's not just a question of a small numerical constant in front. It's rather the question of a conceptual scaling relationship, how uh, the memory storage capacity of this network grows as you increase the size of the network. I have a question. I think that's a method, like how does now the behavior of the network, its robustness to noise, change yes yes it's a great question and uh indeed um it, it's a valid concern because uh what i'm saying is that uh, let, let's think about binary variables right so if i have an uh binary variable uh of length n like sigma i the total amount of configurations that i can have in my space is two to the power n right so it's an exponentially big space and now, uh, if I go from the classical Hopfield network to dense associative memories, what I do is I try to pack more and more memories in the same amount of configuration space. And you're right that at some point I might be able to pack so many memories that I would not have any error correction properties around them, right? So I would have like literally every state occupied by the memory, and then the next state would be occupied by a different memory. And that's bad. But it turns out that there is a very interesting regime, uh, and that's precisely the regime that I'm going to uh, try to work in, uh, which corresponds to the following situation, that your capacity is much bigger than uh, linear, but it's still much, much, much smaller than two to the power n. And that's the regime when, on the one hand, you have many more memories than linear, but on the other hand, each memory has still a substantial basin of attraction around it so that it can actually like flip the spins and uh, uh, correct the errors like uh, I have shown you on the first slide, right? So and, I, have, I have a question. Uh -huh. so what is the physical basis for having n greater than two? I mean, why is the energy going as cubic or exponential? Because my question is, is there a, I mean, other than the mathematical structure, is there some physical reason why? Yes, yes, there is a, Indeed, there is a very uh, simple and natural physical reason. And the physical reason is the following, that uh, the reason why uh, why the conventional uh, old Hopfield network struggles with uh, too many memories is the following, that if you take two memories uh, and you uh, try to put them in this model, sometimes what the uh, network is doing, instead of having one local minima, minimum at one memory and another local minimum at the other memory, it creates one local minimum in between them. So the system is just does not have enough, you can call it expressive power or nonlinearity to actually pull those two local minima apart. And because you add this nonlinearity to this uh, to this energy functional, you can actually allow uh, to have two separate local minima that are do not interfere with each other. And that's kind of the conceptual reason why uh, why the network on the right works much better than the network on the left. So I don't know if that's enough of a physical intuition. No, uh, so one way I am thinking about is you have more roots of the equation now. So you have more degrees of freedom. 
to be able to separate that out. That's the way I'm trying to understand it. Does that make sense? In some sense, in some sense, it has exactly the same number of degrees of freedom because the degrees of freedom are sigmas. And you have n sigmas on the on the right and n sigmas on the on the left. So each uh, sigma is exactly uh, the same variable. Yeah, I was referring to the roots of the equation. When n is greater than two, you have more roots of the equation. So that's what I meant when I said degrees of freedom. It has to do with the steepness of the energy functions. Yes, yes. I would say that's a uh, that's a, like a, a more accurate way to put it. Indeed, it has something to do with the steepness of the energy function. And what you would like to do is the following. Uh, you would like to have the energy very steeply, very rapidly increase around your memories so that uh, the increase of the energy around one memory does not interfere with the corresponding increase of the energy around uh, memory, which is uh, next door. Right, and and it turns out that the nonlinearity really helps because each basin of attraction, each local minimum becomes deeper and better separated from the rest of the local minimum. So that's kind of like a physicsy intuition uh, behind the uh, uh, dense associative memory. Yeah, did I answer your question or not quite? Yeah, I just need to think about it. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. If I may, um, um, uh, if it works. So, are you familiar with the work by um, Chu, uh, Chue and Goodman? Um, they had some very similar approach to um, extending the capacity of the Hopwell network by adding this linearity um, um, in, in the um, energy function. And uh, this was in before NURIPS was NIPS, and this was 1988. Uh, yes, I might not be uh, familiar with exactly uh, the paper that, that you have mentioned, but, but you're right. There were many ideas uh, around like 1987, 1988, where people, uh, where people played with various nonlinearities and various uh, uh, higher order terms in the energy function. And- uh, And very associated memories. Yes. Uh, In that case, repeat here. <laughs> 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 higher order memories. Yes. Higher order associated memories. Yes. 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 So, so uh, indeed, uh, uh, there are, uh, there there has been a good amount of papers, and I should have a slide um, somewhere. Oh, that's uh, okay. Continue. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe continue with yeah. the talk and then other than the chairman. Sure. I mean, no, 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 no. It, it's, it's a very important point. Okay, I don't have a slide uh, here, but, but indeed you're right. So the uh, big difference between, the, uh, between those models and uh, dense associative memory is the following. Uh, so, so first of all, those models, they belong to the class of dense associative memories. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, kind of, you know, the two interesting features of uh, 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 this paper that came out in 2016 uh, was the following, that first of all, uh, it turns out that uh, this increase in the memory storage capacity is not only true about uh, that specific model with the power function, but there is a whole class of models and essentially uh, uh, that have this property. And essentially the only thing that you need uh, to satisfy to have this uh, super linear memory storage capacity is uh, that your function, your activation function needs to increase sufficiently rapidly if you approach one of the memories. So that was one thing. Uh, so it's not just one model, it's a whole class of models. And you can pick any activation function uh, provided that it has these properties and you will get a super linear storage capacity. The second thing that became clear is that it is not only true about binary variables, but also true about continuous variables. So uh, uh, like in, in those works uh, uh, by uh, Psaltis, uh, by uh, uh, Venkatesh, by uh, Abbott, uh, by Arian, uh, the only uh, kind of you know, network that was uh, studied is a binary network of, uh, as I described with sigma i is equal to plus minus one in the power activation function. But it turns out that this phenomenon is a much more general. So first of all, it is valid for continuous variables as well in the same way as it is valid for binary variables. 
and it also is valid not only for power functions, but for pretty much any re sufficiently rapidly growing activation function. Yes. And, yeah. and the reason why uh, you would care about uh, continuous functions, of course, because you want to do machine learning, right? So you want to somehow learn those memories. You want to differentiate with respect to parameters, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, with binary variables, that's a little hard to do. Yeah. So, so you know, my question like this, so sure. Events memory network, but you also have many more parameters because in the classical one, you have just the square of N, the dimensions right, of, of the number of variables. Now you get effectively N times K, right? And, and sure. It, um, yes, but you know to practice. this. On the on, on, on the one hand side, you on the one hand side you are right, but think about it like this: think about size as parameters. So you give me my memories, right? And you are asking me to design an energy function to store them. So both on the left and on the right, I have a k multiplied by n parameters. Not on the left. Is n number. Excuse so me. On the left. Yes. In in classical Hopeful network, there's only n squared parameter, the TIJ. But, 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 but let's think about it differently. So you're thinking about parameters as TIJ, but let's think about parameters as psi mu i. Because they are, uh, in fact, like the more natural set of parameters. These are memories that I would like to store, right? And from that perspective, uh, the model on the left has n multiplied by k parameters, not n squared, n multiplied by k. And the model on the right also has n by k parameters. So it's exactly the same number of parameters. It's exactly the same number of uh, uh, dimensional space. It's n dimensional binary space. But the model on the left can only store a uh, linear number of memories. And the model on the right can store super linear. Well, sorry. The, the best way to find parameters, right? Because let me continue. And then yeah. Can keep the, yeah, I think yeah, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, we can we can have this conversation at the end. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Please. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, but but I want to kind of to emphasize that the number of parameters in the model on the left and on the right is exactly the same. The number of parameters is the same. The number of degrees of freedom is the same. But the number of local minima on memories is very different. And that's uh, that's like uh, the point of. Uh, oh, I think I think what Jerry is saying is basically the number of parameters to describe those minima. Are larger on the right than uh, on the left. That was my original question of what was the physical basis. Yeah, but, but from an engineering point of view, if, if you store it, the number of bits in your memory is only square in the number of n. Yeah, yeah, but the, 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 the matrix, the matrix, the it's a low rank. And yeah. I think that's the point. The effect of the number, the minimum number of parameters you would need to describe the matrix TI is lower it's just you blow it up to a big square matrix that you if you start memory it's n squared in size but you can you can only store less than n memories in there and the rank of the matrix is the is, is proportional to the number of memories you start in there if i understood correctly so somehow like on the left hand side you have you use a huge matrix with a lot of parameters The problem is that I occasionally lose uh, uh, the sound from you, and uh, I can only like understand part of what you're saying. Can you hear me? Check, check, check. One, two, three, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you online, uh, Dimitri. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I, I can hear you, but I, I think we have we sometimes have connection problems with the main. Uh, yeah. I'm going to yeah. pause the recording for the time being. Okay, yeah. let, me, let me just, yeah, let me just say the following thing. Uh, so what I'm saying is that it is wrong to think about the model, about parameters here as TIJ. Because indeed, if you think about TIJ, then uh, the number of parameters is n multiplied by n minus one over two, or n multiplied by n plus one over two, depending on whether or not you are including diagonal terms here. 
And uh, but these are effective parameters. These are not like the degrees of freedom that you have given to me. The degrees of freedom that you have given to me are actually memories side. Yes. If, if I have a uh, k of those and each memory is of the size n, then the number of parameters that you had given to me is k multiplied by n. And uh, the model on the left can be written in terms of size, like here, like this formula is uh, exactly what I mean. And the model on the right can be written in terms of size. And they have exactly the same number of parameters and exactly the same number of neurons. Yet I'm claiming that in the model on the left, you can only store linear number of memories. And in the model on the right, you can store super linear. Right? So then that K is less than N, right? Is this a, the assumption? Uh, no, no, actually, no. there is no such an assumption. Here you can, uh, even in the model on the left and in the model on the right, you can put any K. You can because give me a of images and uh you can uh and you can have like 10 neurons and you can write TIJ, but the problem is that you would not be able to retrieve uh, uh from this system the million images that you had given to me. Only two. Yeah, uh, I mean you, you would I mean there would be some number, I don't know how many, but you would you would you might be able to retrieve some uh you know averages of those images or something like that. But the cool thing about the model on the right that uh, you have an extra sort of knob that you can play with, which is the power M or the activation function uh, that you put uh, right there. And by picking that power N sufficiently big, you can actually retrieve all million memories that you had given to me. Well, right? let's see the match. <laughs> let's see the match. <laughs> Go on, Dimitri. Yeah, please proceed. Okay, sorry. I, I, you guys are like like being interrupted, and I can I sometimes can understand what you are saying, but not always. Yeah. So just you know, if uh, if there are any drops, just repeat the question again. Yes. Okay. So let me move on to the next slide. So as I said, and as we all know, in deep learning, we like continuous variables because we want to train the networks, right? We want to do back propagation. We want to differentiate things. Everything needs to be smooth. And it turns out that there is a very nice uh, formulation in terms of continuous variables and also, if you wish, in terms of continuous time in the form of nonlinear differential equations. So essentially, pretty much uh, the system that I have described to you on the previous slide can be written as a system of coupled nonlinear differential equations. So let's say that V uh, is the uh, internal state of the neuron, for example, a current that runs through the neuron. Uh, then you can write equation of that sort. Uh, uh, DVI DT is equal to uh, external current I uh, plus the decay term, like the standard firing rate model, plus the effect of other neurons. And uh, the effect of other neurons is described using synaptic weights xi that connect uh, postsynaptic neuron I and presynaptic neuron mu and the firing rate of, of the presynaptic neuron, which is denoted here by F mu. So essentially, it's a, a kind of you know conventional firing rate model from the neuroscience textbook. But it turns out that by picking the activation functions F and G in these equations in a proper way, you can actually get pretty much any uh, model from the dense associative memory uh, a class of models. And you can accurately describe that model in continuous variables and in continuous time. So, so what is the intuition behind HM? You're using all oh, the internal state. Is the state OK? Yeah. OK. 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 I didn't get your question, but it seems like you went. <laughs> yes. So I'm not going to explain this statement because it's somewhat uh, tricky and requires a bit of a mathematics uh, uh, manipulations to explain this. But I ask you to believe me uh, that indeed uh, you can essentially reformulate any dense associative memory in this continuous form. And if you want to learn how to do it, uh, please take a look at one of these uh, papers that are mentioned uh, here at the bottom of this slide. So another uh, interesting thing and uh, uh, related to associative memories is uh, transformers. And I'm sure uh, most of you have heard about transformers. Pretty much all the uh, state-of-the-art uh, results in NLP these days are obtained uh, with 
uh, some form of transformer architectures. Like uh, ChatGPT, for example, is an example of a transformer. And uh, around 2020, 2021, people realized uh, that the self-attention operation in transformers is a special limiting case of dense associative memory if a certain activation function peaked as a softmax. And uh, uh, kind of in order to make this statement more precise, I'm going to relate uh, this, uh, uh, this activation function F that I have introduced here to the softmax. So essentially, if you pick capital F in this formula to be an integral of the softmax, uh, and the integral of the softmax is log of the sum of the exponents, then you can show that uh, this model that I have described in this portion of the slide is essentially identical to the self-attention mechanism in transformers. And uh, the reason why uh, this uh, might be interesting is because uh, on the one hand, you can uh, take some pre-trained transformer, for example, BERT or I don't know, GPT-2 or something like that, that's like uh, openly available, and uh, start interpreting the computational strategies of those models through the uh, theoretical prism of associative memories, energy, et cetera, et cetera. And by doing that, you can get some insights about uh, how these large language models work. Uh, moreover, and even more ambitiously, you can uh, take this uh, sort of overarching idea of dense associative memories as the sort of core foundational idea behind transformers. And you can try to design uh, new uh, architectures for transformers that are even more aligned with the ideas of associative memory. And that's something that I'm personally very interested in. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our efforts on that front on the next few slides. So let me uh, talk about uh, this architecture that we recently uh, introduced uh, that we called energy transformer. And the idea here is that we would like to build a neural network that is, uh, on the one hand, uh, a dense associative memory, this new generation of Hopfield network, but on the other hand, is a, a perfectly valuable transformer architecture from you know, AI textbooks. So can we somehow combine these two ideas together? And uh, I don't know how much you guys know about transformers and uh, 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 and how much uh, how much I need to explain how they work and what they do. Uh, so if uh, for whatever reason I need to like provide more background and more sort of definitions on transformers, please uh, let me know. But essentially, imagine that we are trying to solve the following problem. Imagine someone give me gives me an image. And I take that image and I, uh, first of all, I split that image into patches. So here I took an image and I split it into uh, four patches. And then I'm going to include some of those patches. So I'm going to say that I'm going to remove this portion of the image and this portion of the image. And then I want to give this uh, as initial state to my uh, energy transformer block. And I'm going to iterate that energy transformer block a couple of times through itself. And by the time it reaches a fixed point, I want to get a nice properly looking uh, image, uh, which is a plausible auto completion of the image that I have given at the beginning. And importantly, unlike the previous example uh, in my first slide, this one, where I knew what the images uh, will, be, what kind of images will be given to this network up front. So someone gave me, say, a hundred images, and I embedded those images as local minima of this energy function. In the energy transformer paradigm, this could be a generic image. So I could take like a, a screenshot of uh, this room that you are sitting in right now. And I could include some of the patches and I could uh, send it to my energy transformer and I expect it to produce a meaningful auto completion. So it should not be like some predefined image. It should be some generic image that, you know, we can take uh, a picture of on, you know, in some situation, right? So can we build a network uh, that has these capabilities or not? And uh, that's what I'm going to uh, uh, try to tell you about. So essentially, uh, the idea is the following. Um, on the left in this slide, you can see the standard transformer block that everyone is using. So this transformer block is used in ChatGPT, for example. So essentially, the way it works uh, is the following. You take a token 
So essentially, each unit of information in transformers is called a token. And the token can be a word or a part of the word. Or uh, if we are uh, doing vision transformers, a token is one patch. So uh, for example, if we are dealing with these kinds of images, uh, this whole image will have four tokens. This is token number one, this is token number two, token number three, and token number four. So um, question in, in the image, can a token be a pixel? Technically, it can. It can be as little as a pixel. It can be uh, as big as, you know, a substantial portion of the image. Yes. And uh, ideally, in the ideal world, if we had like completely unlimited computational resources, we would like to go to the uh, level of uh, token being a pixel. So let's say that pixel has three uh, channels, RGB. So we can take those three channels and we can say, this is my token. And then I can somehow mix those RGBs uh, in the right way. In practice, this is uh, uh, the whole sort of uh, business of training transformers is extremely computational demanding enterprise. And, uh, you know, that's like part of the reason why not everyone can have their own chat GPT, right? Because it's a very expensive uh, thing to train. And in practice, in order to train such a systems, you would not go to the, uh, uh, to the degree of, uh, you know, having one patch per pixel, but rather having like substantial portions uh, mm -hmm. of the image uh, that represent the patch. Okay. But, but you can still work with this. So like, like in practice, uh, we typically work with images that are of the size 224 by 224. Uh, and uh, the patch size typically is a window of the size, say 16 by 16 uh, pixels or something like that. Yeah, so they can be quite substantial. So, but then after you take uh, those uh, uh, those tokens, you can feed them into this uh, standard transformer block. And the standard transformer block takes a token, a set of tokens as the input. And then it produces the uh, set of tokens as the output. But within the block, some interesting computation happens. And this computation uh, is roughly speaking defined by these two blocks. The first block is the attention operation, and the second block is the feed forward operation. Now, because in everything that we are doing, we would like to have not only just you know a feed forward transformer, but we would like to have a hot field network. And what this means is that first, uh, the network needs to be recurrent, and second, the network uh, needs to have the energy function. What we would like to do is the following. We would like to design or redesign this multi-head attention operation and the feed forward operation in such a way so that they can be described as a gradient of some well-defined energy. And that's essentially the uh, central idea behind energy transport. So in order to do this, it turns out that you need to do several things. First, uh, you need to slightly modify this uh, energy transformer block. Uh, one modification is the following. Instead of so, taking... I, I have a question, please. So yeah. does the left diagram correspond to the whole standard transformer block? No. The left one, yes. The left one is the standard one. Mm -hmm. The right diagram uh, corresponds to what? The right diagram corresponds to the new architecture that I'm about to describe. So the whole thing, the block on the left is corresponds to the block on the on the right. Correct, correct. Like this whole thing on the left corresponds to right. this thing on the right. And uh, what I'm trying, what I'm, what, I, what I'm uh, about to explain is the following. Uh, so, what are the differences between the thing on the left and the thing on the right? Right. Uh, and uh, in order to to do that, I want to like to repeat the main sort of desiderata of what we would like to achieve with the thing on the right. And what we would like to achieve uh, are two things. First of all, we want to have a global energy function that whatever this thing on the right is doing, it has to minimize a global energy function E. And the second thing that we want to, uh, 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 to achieve on the right is that it needs to have some kind of memory-based interpretation. And I'm gonna talk about this uh, in a minute. But in order to uh, make the thing on the right compatible with the energy, you need to slightly change uh, this a module, this block. And uh, you need to do many modifications. First, you need to modify the multi-head attention operation. You also need to modify the feed forward operation. 
And you also need to modify the order in which these operations are executed. So, so let me uh, start. Question, mm -hmm. uh, what is GI? Is it the state? So G, uh, right. So XIIA is a token. So yes. X, two indices, index I and index A. Index I correspond to the vector index. So think okay. about vector index like this. I take an image patch and I map it into some latent space using some affine transformation. So okay. that dimensionality of that vector space uh, is equal to D. And that's what is indicated by the index I. Now, capital index A represents different tokens. So essentially coming back to this image, uh, this token is going to be A equals 1, this is A equals 2, A equals 3, A equals 4, All right? So you take this uh, set of tokens, you feed them into the transformer block, and the transformer block produces as an output also the set of tokens. But inside the block, it's going to mix those tokens. Because essentially, in order to figure out what we should plot right here, our network should be able somehow to look at other tokens. Right, yes. because otherwise we have no clue what uh, what uh, could be a plausible auto completion of that image. So it needs to be able to look at other tokens, and it needs to somehow some kind of uh, do some kind of routing of the information from the open tokens to the occluded ones. And that's kind of like the computational desiderata for this uh, uh, for uh, for this architecture. So now, what is G? G is an activation function. Uh, in practice, in transformers, this is a layer normalization, uh, but technically it can be arbitrary activation function. And essentially, GIA is a function of XIA. Think about it uh, when it comes to, say, biology, think about XIA as an internal current uh, that goes through the neuron. And think about GIA as a firing rate of that neuron. Oh, the firing rate, not the membrane yeah. for that. Uh, sorry? Not the membrane potential. Uh, uh, not the membrane. I, I would say more appropriately, let's think about GIA as a firing rate. Yes, okay. that would be a more close uh, analogy. Mm -hmm. Right. So kind of to uh, close the discussion on this slide, what I want to emphasize is the following thing, that multi-head at attention, which is a standard block in many uh, you know standard uh, AI systems, uh, roughly speaking, corresponds to this block, multi-head energy attention. The feedforward network, roughly speaking, corresponds to this module that we call the Hopfield network. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, these two modules in the network on the right, they act in parallel to each other, while in the network on the left, they act consecutively. And that's uh, the third difference between uh, sort of these two modules. But it turns out that if you put all those uh, mathematical details inside uh, this block on the right, you can show that it does have a well-defined energy function. And the dynamics of tokens in transformers is actually minimizing that energy function. And again, I kind of, you know, I uh, speak about these ideas with many audiences, and I always have to emphasize one aspect here because because many people are doing AI these days. And in AI, you always minimize some kind of loss function with respect to weights. And when people see uh, these kinds of minimization, they immediately think that I uh, just chose to call uh, the loss function by a new name and call it an energy. And I just want to emphasize that that is not the case. That is, uh, the energy function here is a very different uh, uh, beast compared to the loss function. So the energy function here is minimized with respect to the state of the network, not with respect to the weights, how we normally optimize the loss function. So even if you imagine that I have trained this network somehow and I have all the weights already given to me, my network would still uh, minimize the energy function during the inference time, right? So that's like the crucial aspect, which is very different, uh, a big difference between Hopfield networks and feedforward neural networks. Because feedforward neural networks in deep learning, they do not optimize anything at inference time. They're just like a collection of layers stacked on top of each other. Hopefield networks do. Even when all the weights are fixed, when we're not training the network, when someone already trained it for us, we can run it in the inference time and the uh, network itself will minimize the energy. Having said this, 
we do have a loss function, the conventional loss function that everyone else in AI is using for Hopfield networks as well. And we use that loss function for training these uh, uh, energy uh, transformers. Right? Your, but your energy transformer is computationally more intensive at infinite because it has to run all these dynamics, isn't it? Not quite, not quite. Think about it like this. In conventional deep learning, what you need to do is the following. You need to take this energy block, and uh, sorry, this uh, transformer block, and you need to stack 10 blocks like that on top of each other. And that's yes. what your whole transformer is, right? So like, like in a sense, what I'm showing here is one layer. In our network, you need to take one layer and you need to apply it recurrently. But if you apply it for 10 steps, then the number of flops that you have to do with uh, this recurrent energy transformer block is roughly speaking the same than the number of flops that you need to do uh, with the feed forward transformer block with 10 layers. Okay, yeah, that, that's nice. That's a very nice intuition. Well, I'm just wondering what you explain is what is called the vision transformer or image transformer, right? That yes. is you actually used in the computer vision for feature learning. Yes. And, it, and the other question is also actually the way it's used successfully is, is that, we, that they only keep 5% or so of the tokens and everything else is filled in. So then they are most successful when you only keep a very small amount of tokens. Uh, that I'm not sure I understand what you mean yeah. by that. Uh, oh, what, what, what I, I've seen in the papers that the feature learning is most successful when you keep not 50%, like shown in your drawing of the image. Ah, yes, I, I see. A very small amount, like 5%. Yes, yes, yes. yes correct, correct. Typically, yes, typically, uh, like again, this slightly, this statement is slightly architecture dependent. But typically, when people you train vision transformers, what they do is uh, they occlude most of the tokens. Not like uh, like here, I occlude uh, half of them, but they occlude yes. eighty percent of the tokens. They only present twenty percent of the tokens, and they want the network to predict eighty percent of the tokens. The goal is feature learning, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in a sense, you're right. This is a feature learning, but the feature learning in a new architecture, right? There's a quick point of order, so we, unfortunately, we actually have to get out of here. Ah, okay. Yeah, so then let me just uh, quickly jump to the conclusions, because I, I can I, talk like... We can do another time. Yeah, yeah exactly. That would be preferable, because this is perfect fit to the topics that we're talking about. So if we could get the rest of the presentation at some other time, it would be better than just yeah, starting yeah, it off. And, and this is the workshop and not a conference, and the goal here is to interact. So. We thank you for your patience to answering our question. Okay, no, but I want to thank think, you, thank you for the questions. The conclusion of your alternative architecture is to is interpretation or is it better? So what's next? The next slide. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So I guess uh, the next slide. Um, well, I mean, I, I can show you, for example, how it works. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this movie for you. So essentially, like in the third column, you can see the uh, ground truth image. Uh, in the first column, you can see uh, uh, the initial state, and uh, the columns in the middle, you can uh, see how they evolve in time. And uh, sort of the conclusion here is that indeed it does provide a meaningful auto completion uh, for uh, these kinds of networks. So uh, from the computational perspective, um, one appealing aspect of these energy transformers is that they're much more memory efficient compared to, uh, compared to feed forward transformers. And uh, uh, there are two aspects uh, that kind of you know, um, bring this um, property to them. One aspect is that the weights are shared throughout the layers. Like, like I, I think uh, you asked uh, about like number of flops, right? We always can evaluate uh, the performance of models both using the number of flops, but also the memory footprint. And from the perspective of memory footprint, you don't have to need to store the weights in every layer because there is only one layer that you apply recurrently. And that saves you a lot of space. This idea is not new. For example, if you are familiar with taxonomy of transformers, there's a network that's called Albert, which stands for A-Light Bird. 
And that network does exactly that. You share the weights across layers. But it turns out that energy-based uh, perspective brings you a little bit more than that. And you not only have to, to uh, like in order to find the global energy function, not only you need to uh, share the weights across layers, but you also need to share some of the weights inside the block. And that even uh, reduces the number of parameters even further. So the sort of value proposition here is that uh, these energy transformers can be more memory efficient. And for that reason, they could be, I don't know, run on devices or whatever. Like we can discuss practical applications. Uh, but uh, but theoretically, the cool idea, the cool aspect of uh, this network is that uh, indeed it's an energy-based model and it's a memory-based model, and we can kind of you know uh, uh, design an architecture that on the one hand is a transformer, on the other hand is an energy-based model, and uh, on the uh, and yet another hand uh, it's a Hopfield network because it's an associative memory network. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm happy to stop here. We can continue some other time if you're interested or or not. It's it's like totally up to you. Yes.